Jonathan, we're very pleased to have you. It's, uh, it feels uh, like a, a privilege, and we're obviously uh, we fill the place here. And, uh, thank you for coming. Oh, I'll leave pleasure. Over, hand it over to you. Pleasure. All right, thank you. So thank you for having me. This is really wonderful. <laughs> uh, I've never been to this area. And uh, yesterday, um, the, the reason why I'm here is a weird, convoluted, crazy thing. Uh, Father Richard, who's in Chilliwack, he has a prison ministry. And in 2019, I received a letter from an inmate who was an Orthodox man. And he uh, wanted to carve icons. And he had kind of started and was carving icons. And in 2019, my life was insane because we had a, a flood at our house. And basically, and the flood happened, by the way, on, the, on the Holy Saturday as we were getting ready to go to church. It was quite, it was just nice, nice and symbolic right there. Uh, and so, you know, we're getting ready to go to church and the water had come up on the dike, you know, with the, the melting snow uh, and ultimately... We're watching and watching and watching, and finally the alarm goes off, like the, you know, the sirens go off in the city, and the dike has busted, and the water is coming in, and within an hour, we had to leave our house with water under the wheels of the car, you know, and my kids grabbing the few little things that they, that they could. And so we got kind of washed out, and, and uh, in the world of wandering, um, and uh, during that time, I got this letter from this prisoner saying, you know, could you help me? Could you give me some advice and everything? And my life was so crazy that I had the envelope and we moved like several times. We, we were out of our house for a year and a half. We kept moving and I kept bringing the envelope and like putting it on my desk and just kept doing that. Uh, and my daughters who knew about it, they kept asking me, it's like, Dad, did you answer that man from the prison that wrote you? Because they know they're good Christians. They know you have to do that. And I'm like, no, I will, I will. You know, I, I haven't yet, but I will answer. Um, and so ultimately, Father Richard wrote me again very kindly. And uh, that led to me actually going. And I went to the prison. In the last two days, I went there and uh, met with inmates and talked about their carving and helped uh, Moses with his, uh, with his carving. So that's ultimately why I'm here. But the reason why... I also told you that story about the flood and all of that, is, is to introduce it to the idea of symbolism. Because when I talk about symbolism, like Father said, I'm talking about actually just the way things happen in the world. The world is actually full of meaning. You know, we, ha we have this kind of weird materialistic uh, way of understanding reality, but once you're attentive, you realize that reality actually moves in patterns, in patterns of meaning, and that symbolism actually happens. It's not something that is just a kind of analogy for something else. And so in that moment, you know, sometimes it's not fun. So when your house is flooded on the day that Christ is in the grave, and you end up in a kind of weird wandering death for a while, uh, you know, and then ultimately you find yourself, uh, you know, after all of that, you come out of it and you see that there's this little resurrection that happens, you know, very small one. You realize that the pattern of the story of Christ is just, it actually is the pattern of how things function. It's not, a, it's not, it's not a, an arbitrary story that happens in the world. It reveals to us how the world comes at us in meaning. And so it, it, it is the interpretive frame for events, but it's not an arbitrary one. It's a one which actually makes the most sense of how reality functions. And so what I want to do with you today is I want to kind of go through three steps. One is, first session, we're going to talk about what, what, what is symbolism? What are we talking about? And how does it relate to our lives? Um, and then for the next two sessions, I'm going to take you through the Bible story and also through the Christian story. So we're kind of going to go through Old Testament imagery and why it looks the way it does, how Christ 
transforms, illuminates, brings it all together, and what that means for us who live in the church today. So that's the, that's the plan for the day. Uh, hopefully it will, be, it will be useful for you. And so, like I hinted at, the, the word symbol, the actual word, it, it means two things thrown together. Right? That's what it means in Greek. It's like, put, take two things, throw them together. That's the symbol. And we use it now often in the sense of a metaphor. That's how we think about symbol. We think, like, this is something that means something else. Okay? That's the way we tend to think of it. But that's really not the best way to understand symbol. The best way to understand symbol is in the way when we talk about, for example, the symbol of the apostles. When we say we, 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 the creed as a symbol, uh, what, is, what are we talking about? It's, the, it's not something that signifies something else. It's basically the idea of gathering things together into one. So the symbol of the apostles uh, what it is, it's basically we've taken the most salient aspects of the faith, because Christians believe a million things, right? We don't just, we believe an indefinite amount of things. But we find the brightest points, the ones that are the, that, that, that are, that are the brightest, we pull them together into one place, and it becomes a concentrated uh, star, like a kind of guiding star, a concentrated uh, pattern that helps you make sense of everything else. So we believe secondary things, but those secondary things are illumined by the central things we believe in. So that's actually what symbolism is. Symbolism is the gathering of multiplicity into together in a unified pattern which illumin, illuminates the rest of the world. Okay, so that sounds, uh, sounds very esoteric, it's actually not esoteric. It's, not, it's, very, it's a very basic experience that you have all the time, nonstop, as you're functioning in the world. Right? And so, if, I, if there's a fire all of a sudden here, right, and I have to get out of this building, all of a sudden, I will have to do a lot of symbolism. Right? Because what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to identify what is salient based on my purpose, and I'm going to have to gather that in a pattern, and then I'm going, and that will make sense of everything else, right? And so if there's a fire and I have to get out of here, right? I'm not going to be thinking of tying my shoe, right? I'm not going to be thinking about, you know, whatever random thing. I'm not going to be thinking about sweeping the floor. These are all things that could happen in this room. But I'm not going to, I'm not, those things are not going to appear in the pattern. What's going to appear in the pattern is what's, where's the closest door and how can I get there in the fastest, the, the, fa the, the, the quickest amount of time without hurting anybody else. I'll, I'll put that in there. You know. <laughs> without hurting anybody else, you know, and try to get out, get out of the door. And so that is the symbol, right? It's the gathering of, of data towards a re for a reason and towards a purpose, okay? Um, and so you can see that it's very different. So often people ask me, you know, like, is this literal or is this symbolic? And there's this, there's this weird idea. And my, my usual reaction is to say there's no such thing as literal, at least not in the way that you think about it. That is, there's no such thing as pure factuality. You don't, you have no way to encounter that. You always look at things with a reason. You always have to gather data together towards a purpose, or else you could not see anything. Because there's indefinite amount of ways you can look at an indefinite amount of things, and it just basically just breaks down into, into complete chaos. And by the way, this is, you know, for, for the more kind of scientific types, this is true of science as well. Right? It's not, it's, it's, the, we have this idea that science is just factuality, but that's, that's pure nonsense. Science is not factuality. Because when you're studying a flower, you're not studying a hippopotamus, right? So when you're, when you're studying a flower, you're actually even studying the flower for a specific reason. You're not even just studying the flower, right? If you study how the flower reproduces, you're gathering data into a purpose, right? And that purpose will organize the data towards the reason why you're studying it. 
right? And that's symbolic in the sense that it's a gathering towards a reason. And, and, uh, and there's a, uh, how can I say this? There's a play between the reason and the data. There's a kind of, there's a game. This is the, 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 the pattern of symbolism is more like a dance as well. Because if I have a reason, but the, the, the stuff around that I try to gather doesn't fit, then I don't have symbolism. Right? So if I'm here and I'm thinking, OK, I have an idea. This afternoon, let's build a rocket and go to the moon. We're going to have zero symbolism because there's nothing here that makes it possible for us to build a rocket and go to the moon. And so sometimes the purpose, the reason, can be disaligned with the capacity to gather the body. Okay? So start to think of it in that language. So we, we have a head, we have a purpose, we have a name, we have a reason, and then we have a body. We gather things into that name, into that purpose, into that reason. And sometimes there's a, there's a, there can be a disjunct between the two. Sometimes that can happen from above and it can happen from below. Sometimes you can have a, a wrong purpose, the purpose that doesn't fit, like you, you cannot make a car out of gerbils. You could try, but it's not going to work, right? And so you, you have to align the body with the, with the reason. And that is, that is basically what it is that we mean when we talk about symbolism. And so what, is that, what does that mean for us? What it means is that despite what the nihilistic materialists have been telling us for about 200 years maybe, meaning is inevitable actually. It's the opposite of the nihilism. There is there's no way that you can live in real nihilism. It is impossible. Because everything I do, you know, even the unconscious acts of my body, whether it's breathing, whether it's my heartbeat, you know, whether it's just me walking from here to the kitchen, all of those are necessarily crouched in purpose and meaning even if it's lower meanings. So often what nihilists are actually experiencing is that they have lower forms of meaning, lower forms of symbolism, but they're not able to gather them together up into higher purposes. And so even the most depressed person goes to the bathroom, right? It's like, you can, you can still have that purpose, you still have some purpose, you can't completely avoid it, but usually the problem is rather how to stack those meanings and those purposes together into a world view, you could say, something that is coherent all the way through. But it's important to understand that you cannot avoid meaning. It is, it is, the, it is through meaning that you see factuality. Okay? So once you get that, is what, once people start to understand that, then it's not completely unreasonable to think that maybe meaning is part of the world, that maybe, even though I can't see it at the lower level, maybe sometimes I can't connect to higher meanings, that nonetheless, those higher meanings necessarily have to be there. Because you can, you can, you can put it up at a higher level, like if we go up higher and we talk about the way that we exist together, right? So the way that we exist together is symbolic in the same way that the lower aspects of reality are. Because there's a difference between a crowd and a group. Right? There's a difference between a bunch of random people that are walking in all the different directions and something that I recognize as having one body, a team, or a city, or a household, or a nation. All of those different ways that humans come together, they, they all have the same pattern, which is that you have a bunch of multiplicity, and that multiplicity is aligned 
recognizes that it has a unifying principle that brings it together, right? Um, the, the, and this is as true, like I said, for your family as it is for your job, right? Why am I with these people? What is, what is making us understand that we are one? And even for a materialist, it's really interesting because, you know, why is Canada one thing? Like Canada is not one thing. Canada is an indefinite amount of things. How is it that we can say that all these people living in this land are, have one identity. But the truth is that not only do they, but that's also inevitably how it works. Or else how could we even exist? We would just be at each other's throats all the time. We would just be a bunch of random people bumping into each other. You know, even in the moment when there's a fire, like there's a fire in this room, all of a sudden we will all be, we're already one body to some extent. But even if you had a bunch of strangers walking around, all of a sudden there's a fire. Then all of a sudden we will all become a body. It'll happen like that through common attention. The very fact of having the same attention towards the same purpose will unite us towards that purpose. And then there'll be a proof case of whether or not we can actually function as a body. It'll be a really emergency proof case. Because if we're able to function coherently as a body, then we can survive as a body. But if some of the members of the body are, are just thinking of their own purposes, then a bunch of more people will die than what is necessary. Okay? And so the purpose will appear like that, and then everybody will, will become one body and will, will function towards the same purpose. Um, so that's true in the immediate but it's true especially in the larger sphere. So your family functions like that as well. You know, if your family is going to be one, you need to have things that, now we're gonna to start to think of it as a head, right? You can think of it as the, as the influence of heaven. If you wanna start, start using more and more Christian language as we go, as we go forward, but you know, that you need something above you, something that is above the family and that you can kind of look at. And that can be all kinds of things. It can be a common origin, because the common origin is not found in the people. Right? It's common stories, uh, and common attention. That's one of the reasons why, for example, it's really good, even if you, you know, it's really good to pray before we eat. Because what it does is it aligns your attention to something which is higher than you and then it binds you together as a group in something that you're doing together. Because eating together is a mysterious thing, huh? It's a very mysterious thing because why don't, we, why don't I just stand at the counter and eat my piece of chicken? Why do I sit down with people and I eat together with them and that this is somehow something meaningful and powerful? It's like a mini liturgy, by the way, if you think about it. Uh, eating together. It's, it's, one of the, it's one of the most accessible liturgical acts for secular people today. If you want to help, help people understand what liturgy is, help them understand why they eat together and they will start to understand what liturgy is. And if you think about it, it can really help you understand what symbolism is. Right? So think about, because it, it also has to do with body, very much so. Uh, Think about a family meal, like a big family meal, Thanksgiving, Christmas, something where everybody gets together, some, some anniversary or something. So aunt so-and-so, make it a potluck dinner, it's even better. So all these people, they bring food, they gather all this food together in one place, and now we're gonna sit together and we're literally going to make body together. Right? That's what we're doing. We're actually making body. We're taking stuff, putting in our mouths. We're actually making our body. And at the same time, we're making the body of the family by eating each other's food. And the meaning stacks, right? The meaning stacks because you know that if you're that one cousin that doesn't bring anything, that means something. 
And if you know that if it's that one ant that nobody touches her food, <laughs> that means something. And so the actual making of body is manifesting the dynamics of the unity or disunity of the family. It's a little kind of liturgical act. And so we get together, and then what are we doing? We're celebrating. That's what we're doing. And this is really important to understand what celebration is. Right? Celebration is recognizing something we have in common and putting it above us, raising it up above us. So we basically say, this is something we all recognize that we have in common that is important. And we place it above us as something that we all look at together. And what does that do? It makes us one body. It joins us together. And so that's how, that's, that's why the family meal is so important. And why it's, it really is, like I said, one of the most accessible possible things that you can have even at a secular level that you can maintain. You know, when people tell me, like, what can I do? You know, by, like, my wife isn't Christian or this or that, and, like, I don't know how to do this. You, know, you talk about this symbolic world. How can I live in it? And, like, well, that's something that most of us can really do. Like a discipline of setting the table, gathering things together beautifully in order, in a pattern, sitting together around a table, celebrating our unity at least, and watching how that will bind you. But that's true, like I said, it's true. Like, that's why we like sports. Like, that's why we like sports games. Like, why, why do we watch other people play sports? Like, what a ridiculous, I mean, for a materialist, like, what a, it's not ridiculous, but for a materialist, like, think about how ridiculous that is. So we go to this place, we pay money to go to this place, and then we watch a bunch of people, you know, hit a piece of rubber on a ice, you know, what, why do we like that? What is it about it that makes us feel alive? And it's, a, it's symbolism, right? It's a symbolic reason. It's because we can identify with a team that is acting together in harmony towards a purpose, towards a goal. And when we see that and we celebrate that, we feel alive. We feel together. We look around and we see the fans that are on the same side as us and we feel this, like, this, oh, like I'll even use a little word, like a little bit of religious ecstasy. Like a little bit of ecstasy. We get this sense that it's like, oh, it's gathering us together into something. And in some ways, I mean, and, it, and you'd say, like, it's just, it's not, it's not a very high purpose, obviously. It's, it, it, it's, so, it's not like, this is this great metaphysical thing, but it, it can help you understand. It can help you understand why go to church. Right? Because obviously the, 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 the thing we celebrate in a hockey match or in a, some other sports team is a lower thing. It's, it's fine. It's, it's something that's wonderful. It's excellent. It's you know, physical proudness. It's this capacity to be together as a team. But it obviously isn't enough to hold the whole world together. You know? And we know that because there's another team. Right? <laughs> we know that because there's another team. So it's like now we're fighting, you know, and there's a sense in which we have this kind of ecstasy of being part of a team and opposing this other team, but we have an intuition that it's not enough, that there has to be something maybe higher that we can, that we can participate in that brings things together. And so that's the way to understand one of the ways, like from a bottom-up perspective, that's a, one of the ways to understand why we go to church. Because that's what we're doing when we go to church. When we go to church, we recognize a reason. Now it's not just a reason. It is the reason for all things. It is the origin of all things. It is the story that unites us all together as the human race. And it is this transcendent unity which is beyond everything. It's like, well, that's not bad. That should unite a bunch of stuff together. If we all come and we celebrate that together, you know, we should be aiming at the highest possible body 
that we can participate in. You know? And that's what, it, that's what it does. And it does it practically. It does it very practically. So think about a, a Catholic village. I'm from Quebec, right? So think about a Catholic village 100 years ago in Quebec. You got a bunch of people living on a land. What makes them united? What brings them together? And so in the landscape, there's, again, like quite physically, a building that is higher than all the other buildings. It's the one building you can see from everywhere in the village. Right? It goes up into a nice point, and there's a nice cross at the top. And so anywhere I am, I can look up. And anytime anybody looks up in the direction, they'll recognize this as a point of unity, as a thing that transcends their little particularities, their little thing, as the thing that unites them together. And then in that place that's higher than all the others, that's actually physically higher, you have to look up to see it, that's where we celebrate all the things that bind us together. It's, kind of nice and useful, isn't it? So when people are baptized, when they receive their particular name, we do that there. When people come together and they're married and they join together in a smaller unity, which is this family, we do it there, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so the, 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 the identity of the town will be the name usually of the parish church, right? It's like the saint so-and-so village and saint so-and-so church. And we all exist pointing in that direction. So then around the church, usually then right next to the church, you'll have the city hall, which is also a point of unity because it's a civic point of unity, but it's lower than the transcendent one. And then you'll have the bank. Usually in Quebec, that's how it was. So you would have the You'd have the church, you'd have the civic unity, then you'd have the commercial point of unity where everybody's money is and is held. And so they're all kind of stacked where it's unity, but it has to be held up at the top one. So, and you know, and you could say, well, this is all superstitious, right? It's all ridiculous. Why do we need this? We don't need this. We don't need this to go there and you know, participate in these liturgies and sing together and all look towards the cross and kind of all sing together towards this unity. But we're in a luck, we're in some ways we're in a lucky spot. Because a hundred years ago, maybe you could have said that. You could have said, well, it doesn't matter. You know, this is all kind of bunk and superstition. Just remove it and everything will be okay. But we actually are fortunate to live now in a world where we did remove it. And we know what that looks like, right? It looks like the suburbs. It looks like the urban sprawl. It looks like a bunch of people living all next to each other and not knowing each other. It looks like a bunch of people living on endless roads, endless houses, without any connection to each other, you know, knowing maybe the person right next to you because you literally share like a, a, a fence with them. But I don't know the third guy, and I don't know the, you know, the person over there. I have no idea. Yeah. And then, so remove, remove, the, remove the church, and you think, oh, we could all find identity in the, in the national or in the civic. Right? That was all the 20th century. We could just find unity in the civic unity. But again, look at what the same thing happens. What do you have? Then you have these mega suburbs where it's like, well, it's still complicated, right? All this, all this stuff is so complicated. It just like fuse all these cities together and have like in Quebec, we have Laval. Laval is just like the endless, like endless suburbs of nonsense with no center, no, no place to congregate, no, nothing we recognize as a place that unites us. And he's like, oh, well, we could at least have economic unity, right? At the low, we could, we could, so it's like, let's, let's at least meet at the shopping mall. Right? So we could at least have a shopping mall, and the shopping mall will be like the place that unites us, and we could all spend money together. And that works for a while, but then after, then you end, your, then you end up at home with drones delivering Amazon products to your house. <laughs> so it's like, this is, so 
we're in an interesting place because we can actually see, we've actually had the chance to experience a symbolic devolving over the past century. We've actually had the experience of seeing what happens when you remove the highest point of attention and how it basically starts to fall. And this will then happen at every level and the symbol will become, the symbolism will become diabolical, right, in the very like etymological sense of that word, which is the unity will become division. Right? So diabolical means division. And so what happens at the highest level of our attention will happen at the civic level, will happen at the economic level, will happen at the family level, and then will happen at the personal level. And so it's not a surprise that families are breaking apart, that families are scattering, that people are incapable of holding that at unity together, and it is not surprising that we have a non-stop mental health crisis and that our own personal identities are fragmented into every single possible little imaginable desire that you can fathom, okay? So there's a, a coherence to how the world works and it and we're in a position now where in the crisis, as we have this diabolical moment, right, in this moment where everything is kind of scattered and breaking and, and falling apart, you know, we, we have an opportunity. We have an opportunity because unlike the people who started this process of breakdown without totally knowing what they were doing, not necessarily with ill intentions, just not realizing why it is that the world was stacked this way, and thinking we could all explain through material causes, now we're at a point where it has become inevitable that we are that we re-found these points of unity. Because if we don't, we're, we're going to become mud. We're basically just going to become dust. Is what's going to happen. And the thing about dust is that it doesn't stay dust for long. It becomes the body for something else. And so. You know, it's like if we fragment and scatter and break apart, you know, it's like we're not going to stay fragmented and broken apart. We're going to become the body for another unity. And sadly, often that unity, especially in the modern world, happens to be quite tyrannical. <laughs> it's quite, uh, can be quite harsh. And we saw a few, uh, a few um, hints of that in the last few years where we see both the world kind of scatter and break down and fall into uh, kind of incoherence. And at the same time, we notice, so think, the best way to think about it is to think about that when things break down, when symbolism starts, stops holding, we have a separation of heaven and earth. That's one of the best ways to understand it. It's like earth starts to move lower and heaven starts to go higher. So meaning and purpose and reason and structure and order and authority is kind of leaving. And then multiplicity and change and difference and potential and chaos is kind of moving down. Uh, but that actually happens, right? So in order to deal with the stuff that's happening down here and is starting to break down, you need stronger and stronger structures of identity, control, authority above. Right? The way that the, that the real world, the way that the, 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 the traditional world, the way that the, the fully realized world functions is that these unities build each other. Right? So it's very, it's a, you know, saints make communities. So if you have someone who lives with the unity of heaven and earth in their hearts, then they become an anchor for the community. And that community becomes an anchor for higher forms of participation. And that can scale up to nations or to empires or to whatever. But it actually has to be coherent all the way through. 
right? And that's why we say things like the saints are the pillars of the world or that the, the prayers of the saints uphold the world. This is not a, just a metaphorical, poetic thing to say. It's actually how things work, right? You can see it top down. Or you can see it bottom up. When we say something like the saints uphold the world, we're talking about bottom up. We're saying if you become a person that holds meaning and purpose and virtue and truth and you unite that in you, then you become like an anchor for everything else. That's how the normal world functions. But as we fragment and we break down, then that starts to get separated. So we have systems of control, tyrannical systems, systems of surveillance, systems of, of all these systems that we saw shine very bright during COVID, right? We saw those really brightly. All of a sudden, it was like, oh, wait a minute. These things are possible. Like I can literally have, you know, I can, I can literally have the, the you know, the, 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 the police come to my house and see what I'm doing. And all of these things are all there, you know, as we kind of break down into the chaos underneath. So um, it's important to understand. We'll look at examples of that in the Bible when we get to, this, to, the, to the next sessions. Um, so it's mostly not, to, you'd help to understand that when I talk about symbolism, you know, I'm not talking about just interpreting metaphors or interpreting poetic tropes or whatever, although it is that, right? It is that as well, but it, it, it truly is, firstly, in, firstly, to understand how the world exists in purposes and therefore exists in patterns necessarily all through. And then more specifically, what we usually talk about when we talk about symbolism, which is like, you know, I don't know, interpreting a Bible story or interpreting a, a, a text or whatever, you know, that is in some ways a concentrated version of what you go through every day. So let me just run, run the, what a story is for you, just so you can kind of see what, where we're going, and then we'll, we'll do a bunch of stories in the next session. A story is exactly what I've been trying to explain right from the very beginning. Right? A when I see a purpose and I want to get out of this room because there's a fire, that's what a story is. Right? So you, let's say everybody here, not maybe everybody, but many people here will have a love story in their life. Right? You meet someone, you fall in love, you get married, you have children, or you meet someone, you fall in love, it doesn't go well, things kind of break, it's sad, etc. So everybody here will have some, those kinds of events in their life. But that story, let's say your love story, is interspersed with a bunch of other stuff. You, know, you sleep every day, you go to work, you answer emails, you have breakfast, you know. But that's not part of the love story. Right? It's just other noise if you want to talk about the love story. So when we tell a story, or we write a novel, or we, tell, we bring a story together, what we're doing is we're finding the reason. It's like love story. That's the, that's the, that's the thing binding it. And I will gather the salient points of the story, and I will contract them together in a way that they make sense in a way that says, well, this is, leads to this, and this is related to this, and this is related to this. And even though in my life, it's actually a very small sliver of my experience, because most of the time I'm just standing around breathing or doing whatever, you know, but, although I, it, but these memorable moments are brought together into one story, and that's your story, your love story. But we could do that meta, and that's what we do, is to say, well, we all now have these love stories, but there are some love stories that for some reason are more salient than others that gather our attention. When I hear it, I remember it. When I hear this person's love story, it's kind of boring, and I don't remember it. But when I hear this person's love story, for some reason, whether because it's amazing, whether because it's tragic, whether it's because it's whatever, I remember, I remember that. All right, so now do that for 5,000 years, 5,000 years of people remembering love stories and then telling them and noticing and remembering and telling and noticing and remembering and telling. And what you have 
is a distilled vision of what love stories are. You have Shakespeare. You have you know, the different great love stories that we know. And when we see them, when we hear them, we're captivated. We're captured. Because we know, just intuitively, that it gathers our love story into it. It has a way to kind of gathering something true about our experience into it. But we also know that it gathers my friends and my cousins and all of these stories that I've heard, gathers them all into, into that one, to these few bright stories. Okay? So that is symbolism. Now you could do that meta again and say, what if I told a story about how all reality exists? Is there a way to do that? And it's nobody who's done it. Like, it's not like someone sat down and said, I'm going to write the story about how reality exists. It's revealed from heaven. That's the way to understand it. Right? It reveals itself from God. God is, so you, you could, I'm doing the top, the bottom up thing, but you could do it top down, even for the love story. You could say that when I encounter a story that captures all of our attention together, I don't have a way to account for it with the bottom-up thing completely, but what I can say is that it's a revelation. It's revealing something true about the meaning of the universe, of how the universe exists, of how it exists you know, in, in its highest form. And so it's, it's, a, it's a revelation from heaven. Right? So you can do that, like I said, meta, meta, meta. And then what you, end up with, what you end up with are Bible stories, basically. The Bible stories are revealed from God, but not revealed from God in a way that's arbitrary. It's like, well, here's something God decided to do, and here are a bunch of stories that are related to that. No, they're revealed from God, truly, but they reveal how the world is. Because God created the world. And so they are not in any way arbitrary. They are the pattern of, of experience. They contain the pattern of attention. They contain the most concentrated, diluted, possible uh, lens through which we can look at reality. And that's why they are so powerful and so important. Um, Sadly, I mean, you know, we're, we're, we've gone through a very difficult time in our history where because of materialism and because of this idea that things happen arbitrarily and that they don't have meaning, we sometimes have come to a point where it's difficult for us to see the Bible stories or the stories of the saints or the, the stories that surround us as shining with that bright light. We do intuitively because we still care. Like we still, we still read it in church. We still, we still, but sometimes it's difficult for us to see. Uh, and, so, and so hopefully what we'll be able to do in the next few sessions is to kind of go through a little bit of that vision. And, and, and hopefully I'll try to help to, you to see how those stories that we love and we participate in, they repeat what I've been saying from the beginning. They're basically showing you the pattern of, of the reality. And if you live in those stories, you will live the most vibrant possible connection to God, to others, to the world. Uh, and and that's, why they, that's why they are at the foundation of our civilization. That's why they're at the foundation of our, of our, of our worship as well. So, so hopefully that was a good little introduction, at least to help you understand that symbolism isn't just a bunch of like, I'm not going to give you little codes, like special, special codes that you can know how to interpret this or that. But it really is a synthesis of our, of our experience. So, so I don't know if, we, if you want to have, if you have questions on the first, first session. Do we have a mic? Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Pajot, for that wonderful talk. Um, I've just got two questions. One question is a devil's advocate question, because I agree with what you're saying. Um, but when Rome was falling apart, there was a narrative that this was due to the Romans abandoning their faith in the pagan gods. And so it seems like there is a human tendency 
to say the pain we're experiencing today is because we have let go of something sacred from yesterday. And so I'd be curious to hear your response vis-a-vis -vis, um, Christianity and why in the Christian case it is actually true and that it is not just a uh, mental shortcut that we're yeah. falling victim to. And then if I may throw one in as well, uh, in the Gospels, the disciples are typically blind to what Christ is performing. And so it seems like there is a blindness that afflicts humanity at all times and all places, and that God has to intervene to heal our ability to perceive him. And yet it, it does also seem like there is a particular blindness in our time where we are ignorant of symbolism in a way that they weren't before. So if you could um, characterize these two kinds of blindness, yeah. that would be helpful. So, hopefully this is not going to be too shocking, but um, I think they were right when they said the reason why Rome's falling is because they weren't worshipping their gods. I think that's true. Uh, the, thing about, <clears throat> the thing about the ancient gods is that they did provide that unity at a lower level. So it, the unity that the gods provided to the nations was not false. It was a real unity. I mean, it worked. For, look at the Egyptians. It lasted thousands of years. It's not bad, you know, like in the sense of, but it was incomplete. And ultimately, it was revealed to be demonic uh, in the sense that those gods did not have in them something which was beyond the particularity of the, of the nation. Like there was, there's not enough. There's not enough uh, to kind of hold all things together. And so, you know, there's a, there's, a mysterious, there's a mysterious thing that was going on, let's say, at the time of the Romans, which was, through all kinds of reasons, they were, in fact, breaking down their... On the one hand, they tried to encompass too much. That was one of the problems of Rome. They tried to encompass more than what actually their, their identity could afford them. They didn't have enough in their... God or whatever, gods, and in the way, because they, they, they tried to deal with that, right? Because that's why they made the emperor a god, because they couldn't, they had, they had to find a way to have something that would hold strong above so that they could basically hold the entire empire together, but it wasn't enough. And, that, and, and so the, the reason, one of the reasons, let's say from a meaning perspective, obviously there are mechanical causes that brought about the fall as well, but from a meaning perspective, I think you can see the struggle that the Romans have in trying to find something to anchor them up above so that they can maintain their unity, but they just, things started to, to shake and to, you know, and then you have a problem. Once you've made your emperor a god, you know, that causes a lot of problems in terms of how things will lay themselves out, and you can see it play out, and you can see, you know, what happens when your emperor is Caligula. It's like, okay, we have a little bit of a problem because we made the emperor a god, and now our emperor is a psycho pervert. And so what do we do and everything? So it, it's actually interesting to look at how it happened in that way. And in some ways, in the breakdown you know, of, the, of, the, of the Roman uh, Empire, Christianity speaks into that very specifically. And you can see, if you read the Gospels, you'll see that Christianity is speaking into that very, very specifically. And one of the contentions, if you can read under the the veneer of the, if you can read between the lines of the Gospels, one of the contentions is saying, you know, uh, Caesar isn't God. Caesar isn't the son of God. This one is, right? And so there, there, there's, a, there's a reason, I mean, obviously it's historical that Christ was born in the time of the first emperor. But there's also something more providential, which is that as this first emperor was declared divine, the real Son of God was appearing in the world and was going to show the true incarnation as a, as a counterweight. So, you know, I do believe history actually does lay itself out. And if you pay attention to, you know, the, the historians, the historians are, the modern historians, some of them are so dishonest, right? Because they just account for certain things in the historical, uh, into the historical text. And then all the things that are related to the gods or related to the ogres or related to, uh, related to all these things that are in the Roman texts, they're just like, ah, this is just nonsense. Just ignore that. 
let's just look at the mechanical causes, the economic causes and everything. But I think we're at a point where to look back again and to see how they even themselves describe the, the things that happened like that, noticing that their own people were not worshiping their gods anymore, that there were these strange gods that were coming in and people were creating hybrid gods between the Roman gods and these strange gods. And so you had all these weird hybrid gods that happened uh, in, the first, in the first centuries of, of, uh, of Christianity, that all of this is actually part of what was happening in the, in the meaning world. Um, um, so in terms of the, the idea of blindness, you know, I, I, I think you have a, a good, in, a good uh, intuition, which is, at least for us, the way to understand that is that it seems that Christ is revealing a mystery about how reality works, which was not fully available to people until the incarnation. And we can talk about that a bit later, but you know, and it has to do with something like the difference between Augustus and Christ, for example. And, and it's actually technically, Christ, I think, is revealing something that's actually more true about how identity functions. You know, the Roman idea of the, the God Emperor, for example, you know, that type of figure of the strong man, of the someone who, who kind of holds things together in their strength uh, is not sufficient. You know. So there's actually a self-sacrificial aspect to reality which is real, that it actually holds the world together. And I think Christ, and you can see that in the problem, one of the reasons why the disciples aren't able to notice the Messiah yet is because they expect an Augustus. They expect a Julius Caesar. That's what they want. They're like, no, we need this guy who's going to come on a horse and he's going to ah, he's going to conquer, he's going to do that. And Christ is basically going to tell them, actually, that's not how the world works. Actually, there's a deeper mystery to how reality works. There's, a, there's something about how identities empty themselves into each other, which is more true, and, it, you know, and that will be revealed in the cross. So I think that the gospel story is trying to help us see the transition between these worlds. Uh, and, and also, I mean, it's also kind of, in some ways, you can understand what happens in the Gospels as also something like a, a catechumen, right? The way that the early church did the, the, the initiation of the believers, that at the beginning, it's like until you are in the mystery, until you're baptized, until you're in, in communion, there are some mysteries that you don't totally have access to. So you kind of see that layered where it's like Christ is actually revealing this mystery about reality, but it also you, as you enter into the sacramental life and into the church, you go through that same curve where... You know, the ancients used to, for they, they, you know, they had uh, the catechumenate, and then they had the mystagogy. And mystagogy was available only to the initiated, where after you were entered into the church, then they would reveal a lot of the mysteries. And if you read <coughs> the mystagogical text, you know, those are the most symbolic in the sense that I talk about it, because what they do is they, they use the Old Testament and they, use, they do a typological reading where they're basically saying, this pattern leads to this pattern. This pattern leads, it's always pointing to Christ. But what it's doing is, is it's showing you this, the structures of the Old Testament stories and how they reveal the incarnation. Um, anyways, so hopefully that's helpful. Testing? Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much, Jonathan. It was an excellent uh, first session. So. You spoke of somewhat in your, uh, your first talk about how uh, heaven and earth cannot meet meaning, intelligibility, pattern, and the body to instantiate that pattern and intelligibility can kind of misfire and not make contact and how that's so problematic. You talked about the breakdown of civilization, of a particular country, of particular towns and uh, families and how this kind of just is a thread that runs through or, or a lack of a thread that runs through and just kind of rips apart the fabric of um, human existence, even down to the one with person with the psychological fragmentation and whatnot. So you spoke about how kind of above and below don't meet and how that's problematic, but there's also the case in the, in the Bible, of course, with the uh, uh, Genesis 6 and the Nephilim and, and the, the, the sons of God and the daughters of men, however you understand that, with that which is above heaven and that which is below earth meeting, but nonetheless, that's still problematic. So I was wondering if you could explain how that can occur. How uh, heaven and earth can meet, and it's still a problem. Uh, and I was wondering if you could connect that to something we could see in our contemporary society. Yeah. 
And so the, the best way to understand that is to understand that heaven is a, is, a, is a hierarchy, right? It's a hierarchy of meaning. It's a hierarchy of purposes. It's a hierarchy of identities. And the, the angels, they, they are identities that are, that are secondary. God is transcendent, fully eternal, infinite. And then he gives to the angels dominion over certain aspects of reality. But those aspects of reality are limited. They're not everything. And so one of the problems that happens is that purposes can capture the real. And they can try to contain it as, of, as fully in themselves so that this is what idolatry is, right? This is what the worship of the pagan gods ends up being. It's like, it's a love is a real thing in the world and desire is a real thing in the world, but desire can capture you and love can capture you and, and, and wealth can capture you and all of these, these realities, they can capture you in a way that will make a monster of you. Right? And so what it does is that it, 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 that's why the image of the giants is so powerful because the... Okay, so, so, so think about it, like, I don't want it to sound woo, like, I, this is nothing woo about what I'm saying. I know it sounds like I, now I'm into, like, a weird new age kind of whatever angel description, but this is really, like, very, uh, this is very practical, right? And so, okay, think about someone who loves their work, right, who's, who's obsessed with their job, and he's really, really good at it. And they, they're so good at it that they actually forget the reason why they're doing it in the first place. They basically now become captured by their work, no matter what it is. Now, the thing about that person that's real is that that person will become awesome at what they do. They will become extremely powerful at what they do. They will be, for all intents and purposes, a giant in what they do. And their effect on the world will be massive, and it's impressive when you see it, right? That's one of the aspects of modern technology that's so impressive, is because idol worship works. I don't know what to tell you. Like, it works not in the ultimate sense. It works in the sense of capturing something and applying it with strength and force, you know? But, but when you do that, you unbalance the world because it's not supposed to be that strong. Right? Technology is not supposed to be that strong. It's not supposed to rule us. But if you do that, if you worship technology, it works. And it will make technology very, very powerful. And it will, it will basically be a giant in the world. Right? And that's when Christ talks about mammon or talks about you know, these different spirits of the age. That's what he's saying. And so the story of the sons of God that encounter the daughters of men. Like we always have to understand it in terms of what it what it means and what it you know how it works. And so civilization itself has that taint. You know, that's why in scripture civilization is from the descendants of Cain, because it, it has that problem, which is that if I have a king, all right, so I'll take someone, I'll put him up above us. Right? And then we will now all, for all intents and purposes, worship them. Maybe not worship, but you know, we'll look at them and then we'll see them as this anchor. Then all of a sudden, we become strong and we can take other people's stuff and we can exclude and we can be very powerful. Right? And so that's also what that text is talking about, right? The idea of the giants or the Nephilim or the fallen ones, they are also the cities of the ancient world, right? So think of Gilgamesh, the demigod who is a ruler over, over, over his city. Um, so that's a way to understand it. Now, what, what happens in the story of salvation is that God flips that. God is constantly just taking, oh, okay, we've got this problem. We're gonna, we're gonna, 
We're going to turn it towards the good. We're going to turn it towards something powerful. And there's a great, great, a great example of that is actually the way that kings are treated in the Old Testament. It's a really wonderful example. Because when the Israelites want a king, Samuel says, what are you doing? God is your king. You don't need a king. Why do you want a king? If you have a king, then that king will act like a god to you and will take things from you. Will be like a, like a, like a raptor, right? Like a, a, a bird of prey will come down from heaven and will swoop, will take things from you for, for himself. That's what a king will do. He'll take your daughters, he'll put your sons in the army, and then you will see what a giant body looks like, but it'll be to your peril, and it'll be to your suffering. So Samuel says, you shouldn't have a king. But then Israel says, we really want a king. So we have this king. But then God flips it. And then all of a sudden, the king can be an image of the Messiah. Then the king can be an image of God's authority in the world, if properly ordered. So that's why the, the duality of the symbolism is always there. You'll see it in scripture. It's always there. This interesting idea that on the one hand, you know, God says, don't have high places. Don't have high places. You can't have these, these high places where you worship the gods. And then, again, God gives one to the Israelites. You know, it's don't, don't have, so, so this is what happens with the king is a good example. And then the image now gets transformed, 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 transformed all through the story of scripture. And at the end of the story, you have this image of the heavenly Jerusalem, which is exactly that, which is a city, civilization, with all the kings bringing their crowns in worship of the son of man, who is the heavenly king, that is now transforming the whole story from the beginning, all that Nephilim story and all of that problem with civilization and authority, it gets transformed by God into something glorious. So, yeah. I think two thank yous is good. <laughs> I wanted to uh, ask you a question in regards to two modernist attempts to articulate symbolism. First, the idea of Hegelian synthesis, uh, and second, Jungian archetypes, and how both of those attempts, not just uh, fail, but how they differ from symbolism as you understand it. Yeah, I, I'll be honest with you, I don't, I'm not a, I don't know Hegel very well. Like, I know Jung a little, bo a little more. Everybody always thinks that I read Jung extensively. I actually haven't read Jung very much. I, don't, I have a distaste for Jung, honestly. Um, uh, <laughs> yeah, he knows. He knows. Uh, the, and so, at least for Jungian, I can answer it clearly for Jungian singles. It's very simple. Is that Jung still exists in a world, in a materialist scientific world. And so he, he, he basically creates this vision that there are these mental structures, you know, and those mental structures, they kind of organize meaning and that the gods and the, you know, these religions and all of these things, they're basically projections of the collective unconscious that are projecting these things into, into the world and so that then we see them acting. Uh, but you can see already the way that he describes things. He, he's, he has a perspective that he's taking for granted, which is that what I really believe is that the world is arbitrary and that things happen arbitrarily. I see meaning in the world. And so now I take, I take this weird position, which the human is this exceptional thing that has patterns of meaning that are projected back onto reality. But really? You know, wouldn't it make more sense to say that the mind is formed by the patterns? than to say that the mind forms the patterns. Like it's very strange to think that, so the mind is this weird thing that happens. And now then it projects meaning onto the world. But it, it seems even like in terms of scientific realism, like this scientific reality, to think that the mind would be structured according to the patterns of, the, of just the cosmos. Um, so I think that, yeah, I think that, that obviously the orthodox cosmology is far more coherent, even for a, a modern-day 
kind of uh, cognitive scientist or a modern day materialist. I have some, you know, I'm having some cognitive science read, cognitive scientists read St. Maximus, you know, uh, and Nicholas of Cusa in the West and these types of writers. And really th what they offer is a, is a solution to complexity right now. Like they really do offer a way to integrate the mind with the world and, and kind of eliminate the duality that, that we've been living with now for a few hundred years. And what's funny about that is that when that happens, because it's already kind of happening, when it happens, people won't even remember how people could think any other way. Like they'll just be like, how could they think that way? How could they think that the human being is like the product of chaos and that is this exceptional thing that has consciousness? It just doesn't make any sense anymore at some point. Uh, so, yeah. Um, I wonder if I could just ask you a little bit about something you said earlier. I really connect with your points about um, you know, having a prayer before a meal sort of uh, makes the unity available or something like that. But I feel like uh, there's kind of a paradox available in that where it's like the meaning might be available, but it doesn't really happen until the prayer happens. But it, at the same time, it's sort of like the, um, the prayer doesn't make it happen, but without it, it wouldn't happen. There's kind of a paradox in there. So I'm wondering if you could kind of, I don't know, there's something about uh, making the symbol real that also makes the meaning real. Yeah. I'm hoping you maybe could talk a little bit more about it. Yeah, well, so the way, the way to understand it is to really think about, so when you listen to me speak, you'll hear me do two things often. And so what I, what I tend to do is I'll talk, I'll talk what we say bottom, bottom up. Right? And so I'll talk about how things come together and how they manifest unities. But then I also talk top, top down, which is that unity comes down on us and then creates unity upon us, okay? And this is usually for a lot of uh, modern people, it's very difficult to, to, uh, to account for that. Hence, things like predestination and all that kind of nonsense, right? It's like, they, it's like we have to figure out how is it, and, and the idea that it's like, the idea, for example, like that like we're not saved by our works, that kind of thinking, because it's like they have this weird disjunct where they don't see that actually the one and the other are heaven and earth coming together in unity. That it's a cosmic wedding. That's the way to understand it. Um, and, so, and so the two are true simultaneously. So you could say that like, as we are coming together and praying, doing the thing, you know, we are invoking the presence, to use like a really religious language, we are invoking the presence of God in our midst and that, you, that presence of God in our midst is uniting us towards something higher, right? But it's happening at the same time. You know, it's like when the priest goes into the altar and does the, the anaphora, it's like the priest isn't making communion happen this is something that's happening from above. But from below, he is gathering all together, all the prayers, all of the, all of the intentions together so that God will join. And so that's the, that's the cosmic wedding. That is the, the, that is the bride and the bridegroom meeting at the end of, of the world, right? It's a little version of that that's happening. Um, so I don't know if that, that makes sense. And St. Maximus is like, has a great, you know, a beautiful way of talking about this. You know, it's, you can understand it that, I mean, and even Christ talks about it this way, right? It's like the love that we have for one another, when we love each other, that is the love of God that's manifesting upon us. And that it's like, so which one is causing the other? You could say the love of God is the ultimate cause, but it doesn't happen until, unless we love each other. Like when we love each other, that's how the love of God comes in and, and, and joins things together. So that's the, so we have to, so a way that I do it is I always, if I'm talking about anything, like I, I have a thing running through my mind where I test it, I just test it both ways. It's like, how is this manifesting the communion of parts? How is it manifesting that? And then at the same time, how is it manifesting some type of unitary meaning that's coming down onto the, onto the, the body, you could say. Uh, hello, Jonathan Paggio. It's, uh, <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here, to, to be honest. Um, I, uh, yeah, you know how 
people say Jordan Peterson is like a father figure, I would also consider you a faraway brother for our world. Um, so thank you. Um, sorry, I don't mean to be emotional, but uh, yeah, uh, it's, it's good to be here. So uh, I've listened to you for probably about four years, and uh, you really have, what you've said and what you've expressed has really changed and transformed my own personal life. And um, so as you've been speaking, I, I was thinking about the great divorce. <laughs> and um, as we, as people have awakened to the condition that is our modern culture, and we ascend to Christ, how can we, how can we know that our loves are properly ordered in the way that because a lot of people can say they love God but then not love their neighbor so how do you know that you are um, there's a fluidity yeah, within, yeah. I, I hope you understand no I do I do I do exactly I understand very much what you're saying you know it's a it's tricky because it's not a it's there's no there's no simple rule. There's no simple, I couldn't I could say like, this is how your loves would be properly ordered. Because it really depends on what captures you and in what order it captures you. You know, uh, I think Dante is a really great guide for us in that kind of vision because he, he actually does the work of showing you how even in his own life, his loves have to order themselves properly so that he can kind of attain the vision of God. Um, but I'll be honest with you, like, that's what confession's for. <laughs> right? It's like the reality is that's what going to confession's for. So you, you basically have to work it out. You go to confession, you know, you, 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 encounter, uh, you encounter the priest and you, you basically lay it out. And, uh, and hopefully you have a, a guide there to help you discern the loves in your life. Um, because it is, it's always tricky because, you know, the joy and love that we have for things in the world is a good. It's wonderful. Like the joy of doing a work that's meaningful and of doing it well. That's a wonderful, beautiful thing that God has given us. You know, and the same thing, like the love for my children or the love for my wife or the love for my friends, you know, or the love for a good story. Like all of these things are wonderful, beautiful things. Uh, and, so, and so, but we also know, because we've experienced it, that sometimes these, these very good things that God has given us, they can, they can start to capture us. And then you find yourself obsessed with your work or with someone or with, you know, or, or trying to control your relationship, or there's all these things that happen because of your love, right? So you try to control your children because you love them, and so you have to find, and that just gets worked out, uh, you know, and there's no, like I said, there's no, there's no, sadly, there's no easy rule to that one, so. <laughs> you're a little Hello. far. You're a little far. Hello. Uh, I work with high school students for, that's, that's my job, and I, so I definitely, um, yeah, what you were saying about the sort of like systems of sin that we have, these suburbs that sort of lead to this like mental health kind of come over simplifying, but um, I guess my question is coming from a place of, uh, there's a line in one of the prophets, I think it might be Jeremiah, where the Jews that are going into exile in Babylon are instructed to basically build houses and have lots of kids, because basically settle in because you're there for a while. Um, and so I, like, I tend to see some similarities between that exile, they're living in Babylon in our, you know, uh, suburbs and shopping malls and this secular nation we're living in. So I guess my question is really just, uh, things are bad, <laughs> but like what do we do and what, what kind of advice do we give to kids who are struggling and don't have purpose and how do we, yeah. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's definitely, I, I think, you've hinted at what the situation is, is that on the one hand, it's very difficult, but on the other hand, it's actually an amazing uh, opportunity. It's a wonderful opportunity. Because, you know, you talk about the exile, different moments of exile in the biblical story, and in those versions, you see Joseph or Daniel, for example, where they actually become the brightest light 
the, the shining star that actually ends up saving the stranger, ends up saving those that are the cause of the exile. You know? uh, and that can only, in some ways, happen in that situation. Right? And so it actually is an amazing opportunity for us. But it's really difficult. And like you said, especially with our kids and especially with families, it's very difficult. Um, I would say the first thing is to be very deliberate about the things you do, you know, and, and to understand the situation we're in. Maybe that's the first part, is to not delude ourselves about where we are and what's happening around us, uh, and to not be surprised when the world hates Christ, for example. Because, you know, like, you still have people getting offended. It's like, what are you, why, are you serious? This has been, like, going for a few generations now. You shouldn't be offended that the world hates Christ, you know. Uh, uh, and and it's, not, it's not our role to, especially in this moment, it's not our role to kind of bring back some kind of weird civic Christianity. It's just not, it's just not going to happen. Uh, but it is, in some ways, like I said, a way to become a seed or to become a, you know, something that's gathered and bright. Um, but it's not easy. And, and, you know, I mean, my fa own family, we've struggled just like all of you here. It's, it's, it's hard. For sure, I would say one of the things that I've seen in our own life as I've watched my teenagers kind of is that the things that you put the time and the energy and the love and the attention that you, that you give to your children when they're very young, that seems to be like a little treasure that you're, that you're planting there. And that although your kids have to become their own people, you know, that's hard because it's like at some point they have their own sins. They, they're not your sins at some point. It's like, yeah, you know, you're, you're, you're part of it. But at some point they have their own choices to make their own sins to to live with and to find, you know, find ways to kind of do that. But I've noticed, that, at least in, with my children, that, that the things that we planted, and now my kids now, 13, 16, uh, 19, you know, I'm seeing some of those fruits really surprisingly come out, you know, even after some, some, some of the storms. So that's what I would, I would suggest. You know, I, um, we homeschooled our kids when they were younger. I told you about the flood that we had, and the flood forced us to put our kids in school. Um, homeschool, like, if you have a good community and you have friends and people around you, I think homeschool is, a, is actually a great, is a great option. But you also have to be attentive to that, because you, you do need to have people around. You can't do it on yourself, like, just alone. It's not good. But if you have a group of people, community, people doing it, and, you know, you have ways for the kids to meet and to exchange and everything, I think I think definitely homeschool is a good uh, is a good way because things are really crazy. I mean, you everybody knows. I mean, things in schools are insane. Um, so, and if your kids are going to go to like public school, if, if that's because for us it became necessary, just make sure that the communication in your house is real, and then the family meal becomes primordially important because that's when you're actually you know kids come back, you sit down. How was your day? And how's your day doesn't just mean how was your day. It means we're going to talk about your day. And we're going to talk about your teachers. And we're going to talk about the things you heard. And we're going to talk about you know, the examples that you're seeing so that, so that you can kind of work through all the, the madness of the, of, the, of the modern world. So. Good evening, brother. Um, good evening, um, um, So yeah. You were talking about um, the symbolic of being a unifying sort of medium and the diabolical being the sort of like separating aspect of reality. And I was thinking, surely there are times where uh, separation is good and, and unifying is, is, um, is necessary. And, but, but, but I mean, that, then I thought that depends on the purpose, right? Um, but yet, um, we live in a world where, where, um, because of the fact that meaning is unavoidable and um, symbology not only happens, but it's 
like this is symbolic, right? like marketing is symbolic, everything is symbolic of something. And so, but um, to, 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 um, to bring my point across, um, we, live, we live in a world that when, where symbology is often used uh, to, to trick us and to, you know, like for example, a rainbow flag was a symbol of something and now it's, it's being flipped. And so there is a danger also in that, along with the idea of sometimes uh, separation being necessary, mm -hmm. um, especially Christians, I find that sometimes we're vulnerable to, uh, through things like symbology and, 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 and an apparent uh, similar unifying element to our core beliefs. Um, we oftentimes uh, fall victims of, of those things. So I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about um, just sort of like uh, how do you do uh, in order to discern uh, these um, situations nowadays? Um, yeah, so there, there are a few things in what you said. One is that, you know, um, how can I say it? It's going to sound weird when I said it first, but don't worry, it's not weird. So, so, so Christ has both the, the, the symbological and the diabolical in the etymological sense. That is, Christ, creation itself, right? Genesis 1, read Genesis 1. Creation is unifying and dividing. And those two actually go together, right? So if I want to make something particular... You know, if I want to separate two races of dogs, like I just see dog, and I'm like, oh, wait a minute, those dogs are different. So what I want to do is I want to separate so I can distinguish this type of dog from this type of dog. But then I, that separating is, is a form of unifying. So because I'm unifying the particular dog. So separation and unifying is the breathing in and out of creation, right? It's like this is just how creation functions. When, when God creates the world in, in Genesis 1, he's doing those two simultaneously all through creation, saying giving identity to something is separating it from the others, and it's unifying it in itself, right? That's how it works. Now, the, 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 in the Bible, there are moments when unifying becomes a great sin, very dangerous sin. And the Tower of Babel is an example. And there are other places in Scripture where too much unifying at a lower level is a form of idolatry. Right? Uh, and then there's also moments when separating becomes necessary and useful. And so we just have to be able to see when those things are appropriate and to be able to understand that you know, uh, multiplying and diversifying is part of creation. It's a beautiful aspect of creation. And unifying and coming together is a beautiful part of creation. But those two have to exist in balance. If there's only unity, we have tyranny, and we have a kind of monstrous uniformity. And if there's only di diversity, that's called decomposition. And it's death. And so we have to find the, we have to find the balance between the two. Uh, you know, as for the way in which meaning is used to trick us, this is something that hopefully, you know, some of the things that I talk about is there to help people see through. Because you're right, that <laughs> the, the, the way in which some of, Christ, some of the Christian virtues have been used in the past few decades to trick Christians into believing things that are actually dangerous and damaging to us is really impressive. It's actually, it's, a, it's actually, it's like, hey, you guys are doing a good job of tricking us. <laughs> like, wow, that's pretty. It's like, kudos, you know, a lot of work into that. Put a lot of work into that. Uh, but I think that being able to see the fullness of Christ, that's the solution, right? Being able to understand, like I said, so for example, when, when, when our leaders push for diversity for diversity's sake, you know, and they say, well, don't you love your neighbor? Right? Don't you love the stranger? Hasn't Christ told you to love? And the answer is yes. But 
also unity, right? You can't just have one. And so we can, then we can see through the, the trick and say like, it's like, mm, yes, but. And orthodoxy is wonderful for that because we always say yes and. That's how, what's great about orthodoxy. It's like, yes, diversity and unity. <laughs> Isn't that great? We have both. It's, it's like, what if a glory to God, you know? Uh, and it's like that for a lot of the modern symbolism that, 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 that we see in the world. And often we have the, uh, the key in scripture is often there. Like there's keys in the story of Christ to help us see through the thing. So one of the things that has been uh, used against Christians in the past decades is what I call uh, weaponized compassion. Um, <clears throat> What's interesting about that is there's, a, there's actually a story in scripture which deals with that question of weaponized compassion. And it's the story of Judas. Uh, you know, the, the, the woman, the sinful woman comes in to worship Christ. She has this expensive perfume. And she wants to anoint Christ's feet and, and, and worship him. Uh, and then Judas says, what does Judas say? He says, well... Don't, why don't you think of the poor, right? Think of the poor. Why are we doing this? Shouldn't we be, shouldn't we be taking that money and giving it to the poor, right? So what's the trick? It's definitely a trick. But the story tells you what the trick is, right? Christ says, you know, the poor will always be with you, but right now is the time to worship. And that's the highest good. That's the highest thing. And the reality is that it's actually what makes the other one possible. And that's the, that's the real mystery, is that without the worship, and you see it in the story too, because it says Judas didn't really want to give that to the poor. He wanted to keep the money for himself. So it doesn't necessarily have to be money. It can just be power, right? And so when someone... When someone makes you want to notice the poor, whatever, the broad category of the poor, and you can see that the reason why they're doing it is in order to get power for themselves, then you have to be very suspicious about that and have to be attentive. So does it mean that we shouldn't love the poor? We shouldn't care for the marginalized? Of course we should. We are Christians. That is what Christ asked us to do. But we have to be you know, wise as serpents as well and have to be attentive to when we can see that those that are calling us at that moment to help the poor are doing it in order to get power for themselves. You know, we don't need to be tricked in that moment. So that's one example, but there are many. I think that Christ's story offers us, and it usually does have to do with the symbolism, to say like, how does it, without the top one, the other one actually becomes corrupt. So I was told that I'm too short. <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> um, Alright, so, uh, so hopefully this morning was just a basic introduction to what it is that we're talking about when we talk about symbolism, at least what I'm trying to address. And so what I want to do with you now is we take you through a few Bible stories um, and hopefully, uh, with the help of some a few church fathers that I love very much, we'll be able to see that the stories, although they are describing events, right? They're, 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 they're not stories that someone sat around and made up. You know, they're, they're actually describing events that those events, the reason why they're described in a holy text is not arbitrary, right? The reason why they're described in a holy text is because they give us keys to reality uh, that other stories don't do as well. Like they basically condense things together. And so obviously the best place to start is at the beginning because the, the description of creation in, in uh, Genesis is actually, I think, you know, probably the best description of reality that's ever been brought together. It's, a, it's an astounding description of how the world exists and 
how it exists in meaning, and that's really the way to, to distance the description that we see in Genesis from a mechanical, forensic uh, description of the world. And one of the problems we've had, of course, in the past few centuries, that we've, we've had a problem, we could, like a clash in worldview, I guess we could call it, where as the, as the world was developing this very forensic type of description, right, this in the sense of the, the idea that we describe mechanical causes like billiard balls hitting each other, and, and we, this is what we think is real, um, then we'd have a bit of a problem in understanding that text in Genesis because the text in Genesis is describing a world of meaning and a world of purpose. And it, it's there in the, the, the way that the text is structured. And so what I want to do is we're going to go through the basics. I'm not going to go through it in detail, but we're going to go through the basics of the creation narrative to hopefully help you see that that's what at least one of the things that the text is doing. That it's hard, I don't want to reduce Genesis 1 because it's, it's one of the most amazing uh, stories ever told. It's one of the most amazing texts ever written. And so I, but I want you to maybe kind of frame it for you in a way that hopefully you'll be able to, to see uh, how it makes sense. And so the text starts with three terms, right? So in the beginning, in the sense in the, in the head, often it can, be described, it can be translated that way, right? Or in, the, in the, the, the origin. It's not necessarily a temporal uh, description. It can be, but it can also be in the, in the head, like in the top, in the highest, or in the, the, the beginning. We have God, we have heaven and earth. So God creates heaven and earth. You have a sense that there's something, we don't know what it is yet, right? There's something which is the origin of a duality. And so the duality is represented spatially. There's above and there's below. There's heaven and there's earth. But it's, not, it's clearly not exactly the heaven and earth that we uh, encounter because it says that the earth is empty and void. Right? So our experience of the earth is that it's not empty and void. So it's obviously not talking... It's talking about, it's using analogies to talk about something that is in some ways beyond experience. Right? So because you've never experienced absolute empty and void. You've never experienced absolute chaos. You, never ex you cannot experience emptiness because, that's, because it's not experience. It's, the, uh, it, it's, it's, some, it's a category that is there to help you frame the rest. Okay, And it's the same with heaven. Right, so heaven, you don't experience heaven. You, it's something that's above us. Right? It's something that provides ultimately light for the rest of the world. It's something that provides patterns. It's this aspect that's above us that we don't get to touch, to feel. Right? It's a, it's, and the same with air. Right? The air is the invisible thing that makes visible things move. Right? That's a good way to understand what air is. So it's, you have heaven and earth and the spirit of God hovered above the waters. Now that's a repetition of heaven and earth, right? Because spirit is air. Spirit and air are the same. Spirit and breath are the same, okay? So we have, a, we have this weird category that we've made up in our minds about spirit, like it's a weird abstract category. But in the, in the biblical text, it's basically air, breath, that's what's above, and then the waters as an image now of this emptiness and void that's below, right? These are the two categories. So we have to think about what, 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 are, these, like what are these categories? What, what is it that we're dealing with? You know? And as the creation narrative starts to lay itself out, those two first kind of empty categories are going to start to fill themselves with examples. Right? And those examples will help us understand what the categories were at the outset. Right? So once again, 
what is down here? What is earth? What do you experience earth compared to what we experience in heaven? So what, what's in heaven, again, the first and most important thing about heaven is that it's light. That's where light comes from. And light is an invisible thing that makes things visible. Just like air and wind is an invisible thing that makes visible things move, right? So you can kind of see, like, what is it that it's trying, what is it, what is the text trying to tell us about what are these things that are, we're talking about? And then the same thing with the question of Earth, right? Earth is dark in the sense that Earth stops light. So light comes from above, and then, you know, if you dig a hole in the ground, you go underneath, then it'll be dark there. It'll be dark because it's preventing the light from going. So it's, these images are important to understand what it is that's going on, like what it is that, that it's trying to show us. The patterns that we see up here, they're regular. And that's something that the ancients understood. The higher you go, the more regular it is. This is just the experience of the world. So you have these things that move in the heavens, and they're like a clock. They're regular. You can predict them. You know exactly, exactly. You can predict to the second, to the minute. Like You can predict exactly when this planet will be in this place. And we have this memory and this understanding of it. And it will tell you when to plant, when to reap. And it'll tell you. It will manage your life. So the patterns up here, they manage your existence. They tell you when you're awake, and they tell you when to be asleep. Right? They tell you when to, like I said, to plant, to sow. These patterns are stable, and they are regular. The stuff down here is kind of messy. Right? So it's not like there aren't any patterns, but it's a lot messier. Right? And so even the seasons, like the seasons aren't as regular as the stars. Right? The seasons are regular, but they are less regular. And then the more you kind of go down, the less, the more chaotic or less regular things are. So there's still regular patterns, right? Plants grow, seeds fall, seeds grow. But it, there's, there's a kind of particularity to the way the patterns set themselves up down here that's different from up there. Because I can tell that that's a maple, but all the maples are different. Right? And that maple goes, and then another one comes. And I can still tell it's a maple, but they're all different. But Saturn has been going through the same motion for as long as any human can remember. So that planet that goes through the sky and that sun that goes up in the morning it's absolute clockwork regularity. Right? So it's a, it's a pattern of stability that informs the pattern down here. Right? So when people tell you that uh, astrology is nonsense, it's like astrology is not nonsense. Some astrology is clearly nonsense. But some astrology is not nonsense because you wake up in the morning and you go to bed at night. And so that thing, light up there, is managing your reality, right? And when these stars are in this, this place in the sky, I know that it's time to reap or to sow or for this or that to happen, right? If I want to know when Pascha is, I look up there. If I want to know when Christmas is, I look up there. So the, the stars do manage our reality to some extent, okay? That's important because we've been, been told for so long that astrology is all nonsense. Like I said, the, the, the type of astrology that will tell you, how can I say this, that will tell you like who you're gonna meet or whatever, all that kind of stuff, that's all, that's all just whatever. It's just, it's just uh, it's not very interesting or important, but you have to get the basic idea that when the ancients saw these patterns up there. They realized with reason that those patterns were managing in the sense of giving structure to the things that are down here.
Okay? So that's, the, so that's the first thing to understand. So a good way, a simple way to understand it is that what's above is meaning, it's pattern, it's light, it's spirit. Okay? It's all these different aspects. And then what's below is something like particularity. It's chaos, potential, opacity, right? It's, it's, it's a affordance, maybe that's a good word to use as well, in the sense that it, it opens up spaces for these patterns to find their particular uh, instantiation, you could say, okay? So these are, the, these are the two opposites. Now, what's amazing about that is that those happen to also be the way humans are made, right? So for you, for, uh, for me, meaning happens here. This is where meaning happens. This is where I recognize someone. I don't recognize people from their shoulder. Like I don't recognize people from their knee. I recognize people from their face. That's where meaning is. And that's where I see meaning. That's where I make meaning, right? And that is where I experience uh, my interaction mostly with the rest of the world. Now, the rest of the body participates, but there's something special about the high part of us, right? And then the, can I say this? Like, and then down here, right? That's where the more messy stuff happens, right? It's, uh, that's where the mess is. So I kind of know that this is also where particularity happens, right? This is where reproduction happens. This is where uh, desire can be experienced. This is where, you know, things are, the, the patterns down here, they're a little less regular, right? They're, they're more kind of whim-like, you could say, okay? Uh, and so th there's, a, there's a simple, like, simple analogy between these, these things, okay? Now, if you want to understand the, the story in Genesis, you kind of have to just start to think that way, or else at some point it's just going to become weird and arbitrary. And so, God is beyond heaven and earth. God is the origin of heaven and earth. But once the opposite is there, God appears in heaven. Right? Our Father is in heaven. Why? Because that's where meaning comes from. And that's where purpose comes from. And that's where pattern comes from. So God is in heaven. God transcends both of them. God is not really in heaven. But the only way to talk about it is to say that God is in heaven. Because God is the origin of all these things. And so God makes meaning. God speaks. He says, gives identities to things. And he says, let there be this. Let there be that. And he gives names and identities. And then he sees those and he judges them right away. So he says, let there be light. And he separates the day and the night. And then he sees that it is good. Right, so that's how the world works, folks. Like That's how reality functions. It actually works that way. It works that way in the cosmic sense. But it also works that way for you. That's how you interact with reality. The same way. Right? We talked about how meaning how the world manifests itself in meaning. And, that, and that's how it functions. So if I'm going to do anything, anything in the world, right, so let, let, let's, let's think of the, let's take the analogy of the fire situation, right? It's like, so we're here, we're doing something, and all of a sudden there's a fire, the alarm goes off, and then all of a sudden I have to name something. I have to, I have to give an identity to the situation. And that identity is the same as its purpose. It's not different. It's like the identity is the same as the purpose. And then I have to 
evaluate whether it is good immediately. Because, and you're doing that all the time. You're doing that nonstop, and you're doing it unconsciously. So if you are, like, if I'm going to take my coffee, take my coffee cup, right, before I take the coffee cup, I have to know its purpose, and I do it without thinking. I look at it. I see its reason for being there. Then I evaluate whether it's good. That is, if I want to drink coffee. But I also evaluate the cup, whether it's good, because if there's a hole in it, I'm not going to go for it. Right? And if there's a danger that's going to spill on me, I'm not going to go for it. So I'm constantly evaluating whether or not something is good. So the description of God creating the world and judging it and evaluating it, that is just a simple pattern of how everything works and how you, you experience reality at the same time. Of course, it's different for us because we are not the ultimate source of meaning. We participate in meaning. We recognize meaning. We see meaning. Of course, God is the source of meaning, so it's a little different. But it is analogical to some extent because that is nonetheless how you have to, have to interact with the world. Let me drink my coffee. Yeah, it's good. <laughs> um, and so what happens in the, so, so that's the first thing to understand, just basic structure of how this works. And it, and it actually is also not arbitrary. That is, the way you experience that which is physically above you will play a similar role. So think about what's going on now, right now. So they wanted to make sure that all of you could see me, so they put me, prop me up. They put me up higher than all of you, right? So now I am standing above you, and I, at this moment, am the source of meaning for you at this moment. It could change, but right now, I am the source of meaning, and so you look, all of you, you can see me, and I can see all of you, but if you turn around, you can't see everybody in the room, right? So physical, actual physical hierarchy, is an image of true hierarchy. So when we say go up in the world, when we talk about something that's higher, when we use all these analogies to talk about things that are better, being higher than others, the analogy is real. It's not arbitrary. It's actually how you experience the world. So if you lie down, if you put your face on the ground and you look like that, you will see very few things. And you'll see particulars very clearly, but if you stand up and you start to walk up a mountain, let's say, and you go up and you go up and you go up, and then what happens? All these particulars now form a pattern. And they start to move into each other, and then you go up until you reach the summit of the mountain, and then you have a God's eye view, analogically, right? So it's like now you see the whole world lay itself out in front of you, gathered into one vision, gathered into one perception. So that's, that's how it works. That's why heaven is what it is. That's why the analogy of heaven is not ridiculous at all. It is the most coherent description of how to, to talk about what patterns, what gives meaning, what gathers multiplicity into one. It is the best description. You know, and so never be embarrassed about saying our Father who is in heaven. Like, never be embarrassed. It is the best image to talk about how we encounter God. Okay? And the fact that Moses goes up a mountain and that Christ is going up mountains all the time, none of that is arbitrary. It is really a way for things to work. In the church, we place the altar on steps. We, the, the altar is always higher than the nave. It's not, it's subtle, it's not like a giant ziggurat, but it, nonetheless, it is the way that we set up the space so that we know what is higher and what is lower, right? All right, so then in the creation narrative, you have this wonderful vision, which is that God starts with the extremes, and he starts to create things above and below. 
And you really have to understand that that's what's happening, because if you don't see that it's basically saying, here's something above, here's something below, here's something above, here's something below, and it moves like this until it reaches the middle, then none of it's going to make sense to you. Because the idea that God creates grass before he creates the stars, you know, from like a, just a mechanical point of view, is not particularly, it's not the best way to understand it from that point of view. If you understand it from the point of view of meaning, then it is a wonderful way to talk about it, right? And like I said, the, the fact that this whole story is framed in meaning is important. In the fact that God creates, evaluates, sees that it is good, says, sees, and evaluates. That's meaning, right? That's how meaning functions. So God creates multiplicity here below, right? All this grassy stuff. And then he creates this multiplicity above. So you have the grass and the stars. So he does that the whole time. Like, why does he create fish and birds on the same day? Right? Because this is what's going on. And then it ends with man. In the center. Basically being this anchor between heaven and earth. Why? Because we are the ones that unite meaning and multiplicity together. Right? Humans are the ones that see patterns, evaluate patterns, make patterns, and are able to see patterns in, in, other, in other creatures, in other beings. Right? That's, our, that's one of our function in, in the world. And if you bring Genesis 2 into the, into, into the story, then you can see it. It's beautiful. Genesis 2 is like a, a beautiful synthesis of Genesis 1. Any, all the Bible scholars that tell you that these two things don't go together, they're nonsense. They're beautifully paired together. It's a, it's a wonderful vision to have those two images together. God takes the dust, takes all the multiplicity, all the, all the potential, all this stuff, gathers it into one place, and then what does he do? puts heaven inside. What else would you do? Right? You put heaven inside the, 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 the gathered multiplicity and that's it. That's the anchor. Right? That's the symbol. Right? That's the, that's the place where heaven and earth meet. Okay? That's the place where meaning and multiplicity join together into one. Right? And so that's the story. That's what Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 are kind of helping us see. Bringing that all together. Um, and so, a lot of ways to understand that, you know, if you didn't know that paradise in Genesis, uh, or in Genesis 3, or Genesis 2, I guess, like paradise is, is a mountain. It's really important to understand that. It doesn't say that in Genesis, it says it in Ezekiel, but nonetheless, paradise is a mountain. Why is it a mountain? For the same reason. Because that's what a mountain is. Right? A mountain is a bunch of stuff that moves into one. It's a good way to understand it. It's like just a lot of stuff. And as it culminates into heaven, it becomes a point. Right? So it just moves into, into unity. So it's a perfect image of creation. It's a perfect image of the hierarchy of reality. So paradise is a mountain. And there are different ways to image it to help people understand what this is, and if you have never read uh, St. Ephraim's Hymns on Paradise, this is, I suggest it to you, it is, I think it's one of the most powerful texts in the Orthodox tradition, and he helps us understand what is this paradise? What is it, what is this talking about, you know? So St. Ephraim, for example, says that the top of paradise reaches higher than the highest mountain, and the base of paradise reaches beyond the ocean. Okay? So what is he saying paradise is? It's basically reality. It's basically everything. Everything can be or participates in paradise. Okay? So it's not, it, 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 you'll, it, it pushes you to start to think a little differently. So it's important to understand. I'm not saying, and Sanefram 
isn't saying that all of this is just a myth, that all of this is just an idea. No, 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 no. Remember what symbolism is, right? Symbolism isn't just an idea. Symbolism is that place where things come together. It might not look like a spy novel or some, like, I don't know, like a, the way you would describe the, a crime to a police officer, right? But nonetheless, that's what it is. It is, it is something that happened, okay? Um, and so he described paradise as this mountain that's bigger than, the, that's actually the entire cosmos. Um, but then he, he, he create he tells us about this hierarchy in the garden. So for example, he says things that are not in scripture, but can help you kind of understand. He says that there are no animals in paradise. Um, this is something that a lot of people find weird because you always see those images of Adam and Eve in the garden with a bunch of animals around them. Um, but he's trying to help us understand what this is. He says the animals are on the outside of the gate of paradise. And man moves up and down the hill. And basically, he mediates between his encounter with God and the animals. So he receives the authority from God and then moves down the hill of paradise. And then he names the animals. Right? So then he gives particular identities to the animals. So he is acting as a co-creator with God, but it's, it's helping you understand how all of this works, which is that when God says, God gives a general, a general uh, identity. He says, let the earth produce. Right? So he says, let the earth produce animals in their kind. What? what is or he says, let the earth produce plants that produce seed. What? It's very weird, isn't it? But this is what God is saying. Let the earth, this multiplicity, generate Things that have identity. Things that have identity that perpetuate themselves. So a plant with its seed is a plant that has in it the capacity to continue to exist with its identity. And God doesn't name all the plants. He just gives a general idea of get, let the earth produce things that have identity. And then... The earth produces all this multiplicity and all this difference and all of these things with their own particular identity that then perpetuate themselves in the future. And the same with the animals, right? Animals in their kind. And he separates them into a few categories, which are really interesting, because the categories of animals that God separates into have nothing to do with zoological categories that we use today. They're categories of meaning. The types of animals that God says, he says, uh, he says domesticated animals, wild animals, and creepy crawlers. Those are the animals on the earth. So those are not zoological categories. Right? Those, those are categories of meaning. A domesticated animal only makes sense in a human world. A wild animal only makes sense in a human world. And the idea that there's something there down in the ground that's alive but is like, eh, there's all these creepy stuff that's under, that are under the earth, you know, that's also related to helping us understand what the earth is and what's underneath there, okay? Um, but then Adam comes down the paradise and then he gives the particular names to the animals. So the image of the idea that there are no animals in paradise is there to really help you understand what it is this is talking about. It's like humans participate, and we still do it today. All, what Adam did in the garden is something that we still do today. When someone discovers a new breed of some animal, what do you think is happening? It's like, oh, there's a general category called lizard. And then all of a sudden, it's like, well, they're not all the same, because they're obviously, they, they're different. And so we start to name them, right? like this lizard, that lizard. And then they'll read an article of some, just, I don't know, some scholar, like, in the Amazon forest who discovers this little, like, really small, like, breed of lizards. And it's like, why is that a specific thing? Why does that require a name? You think that's obvious, right? 
It's not that obvious if you don't understand how meaning functions. Because every single lizard is different. Every single one. All the lizard, every lizard that you encounter is different from every other lizard that you encounter. Why is it that we can say that some have names? Right? And it's, not, it's real, it's not arbitrary. It's not like they make it up. They see a pattern that brings these lizards together and they say, oh, that's an identity worth recognizing. We're seeing that it is good that we recognize and we name this animal with a specific name. Because all the dogs, right? The dogs can all interbreed in between each other. Why do we have different categories of dogs? What makes one dog one? And why is it that you can say, this is pure breed and this is a mutt? Really? That's super interesting. I think that's true, but I think from a very purely materialist point of view, it's fascinating to think that we have characteristics that we identify as having coherent meaning and purpose, and then this other thing, which we see as mixture and chaos, right? Those are categories of meaning, and they're the types of categories that are described in Genesis, okay? So think about, again, the mountain of paradise. So we've got this mountain of paradise, and then on the edge of the mountain, the best way to understand it is that there's still the waters, the chaos that's on the outside. You still have the ocean. By the way, that's also how the world still functions. And I know people hate that, but look at a map, and you'll see that a map still looks like that. It's, you've got land, and then on the border you have water, right? That's how we think of things, and it's the best way to think about it, right? And so the ancients understood this, this water on the outside as Oceanus, or Ouroboros, or this, this Leviathan, like this chaotic serpent that flows around all of reality, that basically is this edge, right? This edge of the world where things kind of fall apart into the, into the sea monsters and all of that, okay? Um, that's the, that's the structure of paradise. So Adam and Eve, I don't want to go into too much detail, but Adam and Eve take a good for themselves. We talked about the problem of idolatry before. We talked about the problem of lower identities thinking that they're the highest. The problem of goods that think that they're the highest goods. That's what's going on to some extent in the Garden of Eden. Adam thinks that he could be God. So he takes that for himself, tries to hold on to it. Now the mystery of that is that St. Ephraim, and not just St. Ephraim, but many of the church fathers, they'd say that the secret is that that was actually Adam's destiny. Right? That was actually what God wanted for Adam that God was going to give Adam the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. The problem is not the fruit itself. The problem is taking it. That's the problem. And it's an objective, like it's an objective thing because this is the, this is the thing that we talked about earlier this morning, the problem of symbolism to some extent, which is that anything that exists, if it tries to contain itself, if it tries to be the highest good, whether it's your work, whether it's your relationship, whatever it is, it tries to be the top. Say, like, I'm the top. I'm the, I'm the glowing thing. I'm the one that makes everything else makes meaning. I'm the, I'm the one. Then it immediately becomes an idol, and it loses its reality. It actually breaks its reality. Because the, the, the reality only exists to the extent that it participates in higher goods. If it doesn't, then it's an idol. That's just, how, that's just how it functions. So Adam takes the fruit that God was going to give him and in that gesture loses his connection to the transcendent and then falls because that's what, that's what happens. And that happens to you all the time, sadly. It happens to us all the time. We do it, we do it constantly. We're constantly throwing ourselves into things, thinking that they hold all reality for us, and then if we hold on to that for too long, then we fall. Then we fragment, we break down. 
Think about the description I gave you this morning about saying, I'm going to take the church out and we'll just have the civil authority. That'll be enough. We don't need the absolute transcendent. We just need some national identity to hold us together, some ethnic tribal thing to hold us together. It's not enough. What happens? You devolve. You fall. That goes away. Then you end up with shopping malls. That falls away. You end up with a bunch of houses. And then you devolve, devolve until you're on, you're on antidepressants and you're, you're, you're just alone in your basement and you know, your life has no meaning. Right? So that's the fall. But that's the fall that's described in Genesis. But the fall in Genesis isn't some arbitrary thing that God said, don't do this, you did it, and then we're punished for it. It's actually a description. It's actually a description of the problem of identity and knowledge. It's not called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil just arbitrarily. It's, it's, that's what the story is about. The story is about meaning. It's about how meaning, how identity, how all these things function and how they have to be oriented properly for them to find life. And if they're disoriented, then they break down. So Adam and Eve fall. And what's great about the, what's great? <laughs> what's, <laughs> what's useful about the description of the fall is that it helps us understand what that does, what it does to us, and what it does to the world, and what happens to the world when things try to capture identity and then fall, fall apart. By the way, like, I just want you to, let me just go through a few analogies so that you see just how pervasive this pattern is, this idea of, like, it's everywhere in Scripture. It's all around in Scripture. Once you see it, you'll see that the fall, that structure, of taking for yourself and then falling, it's everywhere, right? God tells Moses, hit the rock. What does Moses do? Thinks he's the one in control. Hits it twice. Bye, Moses. Right? <laughs> Peter tells Christ, right? I'll never abandon you. Never, never, never abandon you. You know, it's like, and you don't, you don't have to die. We'll protect you. We're the ones. What happens to Peter? Right. It's like that all the time. You'll see it, right? And the, the, the image of Peter going out is, is the best one because Christ is walking on water. By the way, Christ walking on water, that's the creation narrative too, right? So you have the chaos down here, right? And then you have God who comes down and masters chaos. He's walking on water. He doesn't, he's not afraid of the chaos. He basically masters it. So he's walking on water, and he's like, Peter, if you believe, I mean, he doesn't, if you believe in me, if you, if you look at me, you can walk on water. If you understand that it doesn't come from you, you can walk on water. So Peter is like, goes out, walks on water. But then he gets distracted, and he starts to worry, and he starts to doubt, and he stops looking in the right place, starts looking around, what happens? He goes down, right? That's just exactly the pattern of the, of the, of the, of the fall, okay? This is there everywhere, everywhere in scripture. It just has, this is, the pattern is everywhere. Um, but what's interesting is that Adam and Eve, they fall, and so they become insufficient, and they have to cover themselves, right? They have to add something to them because of their insufficiency. And that covering gets increased as the fall increases. So Adam and Eve, they cover themselves in fig leaves, and then they're covered in dead animal skins, OK? So Adam is at the top of the mountain. At the bottom of the mountain are what? The animals. Now they move down the mountain, and now they, they kind of have an accretion of externality, where they start to be wrapped in things that aren't them. They start to add things to themselves. That's the process of the fall, and it's also 
it's the process of, of civilization. It's a, it, it actually is a hint of how technology works, how civilization works, how we add things to ourselves in order to supplement our existence. Cain continues the fall, Cain kills Abel, and then he founds a city. Okay, so Cain, Adam and Eve falling, being covered in garments of death, right, is a, a version of then what happens to Cain. The same thing happens to Cain, but now it's bigger. So Cain kills his brother, and then he covers himself with a city. He puts a wall around the community. Right? And so this is, again, the problem. It's the problem of identity that tries to hold itself. Because once you, once you have an identity that tries to hold on, what does it have to do? It has to protect itself. Because it's trying to hold on to everything. It's in danger. It's in danger from the stranger. It's in danger from the outside. It's in danger from things that are not me. Right? Once I try to gather that and I try to just be me, and I think that I'm God, then all of a sudden, all of you are dangerous to me. And that's what happens in the garden, right? That's why Adam right away blames Eve, blames the serpent. Right away, it's like, it's not my fault, it's your fault. It's not my fault, it's your fault. But that keeps growing. And that's the image, at least in scripture, that's the image of civilization. That Cain adds these layers, add technology, and the arts, by the way, sadly, the arts are part of it. Like, in the sense that we have the supplementarity where we increase and make thicker and thicker boundaries, thicker and thicker walls, until we reach the edge of the world, and then the waters are there. So the fall right, is, the, is the image of the mountain and its creation itself. Because the flood, at the end of that narrative, is the equivalent of thinking about falling into the waters. That's a good way of thinking about it. It's Peter sinking down into the waters is the same as the flood which comes at the end of this whole process. So the image of the cosmos, that's what the image is. And that image is an image of, of identity. Okay? Now, now that, that was a long long stretch of something maybe a little difficult to understand. So I'm going to describe any traditional society for you, and you're going to see how this works, basically. And it's the problem of identity. The Greeks. The Greeks, they had something called the, the uh, omphalos, right? The belly button of the world. The center of the world in their uh, temple to Apollo. It was basically, it was literally like a stone that was like the center of the world for them. It was the center of their identity. It's the place where all the people that spoke Greek came to encounter what made them one. Like what made that, what brought them together. And they knew that that, when they were there and they all spoke the same language and they all worshiped the same gods, and there was this belly button, which is the middle, right? That that middle was something akin to the top of the mountain. Something akin to the place where all the multiplicity comes and joins into one. And the Greeks, as they moved out of their identity, then they would encounter things that are not them. They would encounter strangers. And those strangers at first are maybe kind of close to me. You know, maybe they're kind of like me. But as you move forward, Further and further from the omphalos, from the center, the more the stranger looks different from me. Then at some point, I don't understand their language. And all of a sudden, my meaning making is in danger because my identity is no longer sufficient for encountering this new reality where I don't understand their language, I don't know their customs, I don't understand what their intentions are. And then as I move forward, at some point, then I come to the monsters on the edge of the world. So things that really don't have identity for me, that I can't recognize. I don't know how to separate. I don't know how to name. 
right? I don't know how to, to account for it. And think about, like, think, think, think a good example of that is when um, the Spanish arrived in South, South America. Now imagine you're a South American guy, you know, you've got your own world, and all of a sudden there's this ship, and some creature comes down from the ship, right, and it has eight legs, and it's gleaming, and it's shining. It's like silver with color. It's like, what is this monster? Never seen anything like that, right? And you have no mechanism of understanding what you're seeing. You're basically encountering strangeness itself because your identity is limited, right? And so you don't know what a, someone riding a horse looks like. You've never seen it in your life. You don't know how to distinguish the rider from the horse. You don't know how to distinguish the, the clothing from the person, right? It's all a big jumble of, of Confusion to you. It's a, it's a dragon. It's a monster. It's something that is, is mixed up and has no identity. Right? So that's how, that's how the, the world works. That's how the structure of your house is. Like, that's how your home functions. Your home functions has the same structure as the mountain of paradise, you know, where you have your identity as a family, as a couple that's held inside. Then maybe you have, like, let's say, a living room where you would have friends over and they, you could, they could come and hang out with you. And then you have the entrance of your house where maybe the delivery guy you'll let in, maybe kind of, you know. And then you have the porch outside, which is if I look through the door and I don't know who that is, I'm not sure of their intentions, you know, I'll, I'll ask them, what do you want? And then you have the outside, which is, which is the stranger. Right? And that's the, that's the basic structure of the description that you see in, 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 uh, in Genesis, but it really is just the, dis the description of experience, the description of how we experience the world um, in, in our everyday lives and how we view identity in that way. The tabernacle has the exact same structure, right? And even a church, even today, also has that basic structure. You have the altar at the highest point. And then you have the nave, which is where we gather together. You have the narthex, which is this intermediary space where we used to chase the catechumen out, you know. <laughs> we don't do it anymore. We say it, but we don't do it, most of us. Uh, you know, people that aren't baptized would go there during the liturgy, and there would be like this buffer of intermediary identity, right? And then you have the outside of the church, which is unknown, right? It is, the, it is potential, it's, it's, it's uh, chaos, it's all of these things that are not, that we don't know. It doesn't mean that there's nothing good out there, it just means that we don't know, right? That's the thing about identity, like right? that's what, by the way, a stranger is. A stranger is just means undefined, right? It's not, a, it's not actually an identity, it just means I don't know, right? So when a stranger comes to your house, all it means is I don't know. And so there's a process by which the strange can be acclimated and entered into identity through getting to know them, through friendship, through hospitality. There are all these methods by which we can bring a stranger into the, into the participation with our identity. But that is, that's a, that's a real process. And it's the same process that you go through when you see something that you don't know what it is. I don't know if you've ever had that experience. Let's say you start a new job. This is something that most of us, you start a new job, something you've never done before, and at the beginning, you have no idea what you're doing. You have no idea what you're looking at. Right? You, I don't know. Let's say you want to learn, uh, you want to learn to make gardens. And then you, you for me, if I go out, out there, all I see is grass. It's just grass. I don't realize that there's actually like 10 different species of different things that's growing in that kind of just green mass that I see. But that's actually a process of, 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 of uh, taming, where I tame chaos and I make it participate in my capacity to understand, in my capacity for knowledge. So you're constantly, you're constantly in, you're constantly in paradise you could say, 
dealing with the problem of identity. It's something that is just part of our, of our, of our reality. And every time you sin, you basically are reenacting a fall, a little fall. Because what you're doing is you know what's good. You know what's the best. You, 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 most of us would know. But then you decide to take something lower as the highest. You're like, if I could just grab this, then I think I'll get life from it. But then immediately, as soon as you do that, then you start to tumble. And it just happens, it happens naturally. The best, way to, the best way to understand it is, of course, an addict is the best way to, to see it. We're all addicts, by the way. But a real, like a, an addict is a good case study because they, the, the behavior is so ex extreme that you, can, that you can really see it. Where being, uh, like being trapped by some secondary good will then make that person kind of tumble into, into chaos. Uh, but we do that all the time. We're constantly doing it. We're doing it, we're doing it morally, but we also do it even in cases where it's not completely even a moral question. So every time that you're trying to do something and your frame breaks, your purpose gets interrupted, you have to deal with something akin to a little fall. Right? So you're, I don't know, you're going to an appointment and you get a flat tire. Right? What happens? Your purpose is interrupted by a secondary thing. And all of a sudden, you're thrown into chaos. You're basically, now your whole world falls apart. You're not going to make it. You've got to figure out what to do. You've got to reorient yourself. You've got to gather things together again so that ultimately you can then re-aim towards the first purpose you had. Uh, and so that is really just, the, like I said, the, this pattern of heaven, of, a, of a paradise, if you kind of see it as a frame by which meaning functions, you can see that it just repeats itself you know, over and over in your experience. So um, I think that's enough for after lunch because I'm also kind of feeling it. So I'm sorry. I push you hard. I push you hard in this session. Um, so. If there are questions, I'll take questions, and then I promise you in the next session, it'll all kind of come together. Uh, <clears throat> Jonathan, I, uh, is this on? No. I uh, understood everything you said, 100%. <laughs> <laughs> but I do have one quick question. All right. Uh -huh. uh, it's actually kind of, hopefully you can help me with an intuition that I have, I can't quite get my arms around it. Uh, so, the, over the last several hundred years, there's been like this, uh, we're breaking down hierarchy and categories one after the other. And the feeling that I have is that we're doing that not just because it's getting easier and easier, because we, because we can, we did it there, and now we're just doing it in one more places, but that in fact, we must that it's necessary to continue to break down all categories because if any category remains, God exists. Mm -hmm. Anything. So yeah. there, there can't be a difference yeah. between male and female, or otherwise God exists. Yeah. Humans can't be different than animals because otherwise God exists. That's, that's an intuition, but I, I, can you help me understand why or, or debunk it? Yeah, no, I, I, think, I think you're right. I don't think it's necessarily conscious, happening consciously. I think it, it's intuitive, you know, and uh, the, w the way to understand it uh, is actually to, it has to do with the fall. Let me tell you the fall story from a different perspective so you kind of see how this works. The, the, the story of the theogony in Hesiod is a good way to understand some of the things that I'm talking about, which is that in the theogony in Hesiod, you have these, there's a few things at the outset I won't go into, but you have these two same categories as in the Bible. You have the God of heaven and you have the God earth, right? And those two gods are joining together in order to create the different titans, like the different gods that are going to be the principalities of the world, right? Now, heaven is pattern and order. And so the earth is producing stuff, producing these titans, but some of them 
are monsters. Some of them are like freaky with a thousand arms and like a thousand heads and just these crazy monstrous beings. So heaven says, yeah, good, good, no, not good. Those shouldn't exist. Right? And so then the Titans and the mother god, they basically revolt against heaven. And they castrate heaven, and then heaven kind of goes up. Now the problem is that the sun, Saturn, that castrates heaven, now he becomes the head god. But where did his legitimacy come from? His legitimacy came from his father. So you've got a problem. Because now my kids are going to come castrate me, right? How else will I, how else would, what else would happen? Because now I've cut myself off from this highest thing, and now I know that what's coming is going to take me out. And so in order to prevent that, you eat your children. That's the way to do it. Because you say, I'm basically going to just stop them from existing. I'm going to bring them back into myself. I'm not going to let them have independent existence. So imagine that as like just a basic cycle, a basic problem of reality, which is that once you remove your attachment to the highest, you lose your own legitimacy. And then you can imagine it from bottom up, where you have constant revolutions. You have identities that say, this thing above me, what's its a legitimacy? I don't need it. And then they're like, ah. And then there's something else coming underneath and saying, this is a thing, what do you need that for? And so it, it's a, the, the revolutionary pattern itself is a self-destructive pattern. It basically eats itself constantly. It's basically self-devouring. So that is what you're seeing now, which is that you, know, you, you, you have certain social forces that say, well, we don't need this order. We get rid of it. But then, as soon as that happens, that very thing is now going to be revolted against. And that continues on and on and devolves until you get to basically my little whim, this little very idiosyncratic desire that I have is going to basically take over my being. And it's not only that, but it's going to try to impose itself as the, the, the god that everybody has to worship. And so it's like, my little idiosyncratic sexual desire has to be the god that all of you worship. And I'm going to try to enforce that on you. I'm going to try to, I'm going to try to, but it doesn't, obviously, it's ridiculous. At some point, it's like you can't, you get to the end of it. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, this self-devouring thing. That's why the, by the way, that's one of the reasons why the Ouroboros is represented the way it is. There's a negative aspect to that, which is the problem of, Identity that is self-eating and self-devouring, right? You can't, you, you always need to be a, a connected to the, to the higher goods. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to play itself out. At some point, it bottoms out, uh, you know. But the problem is that you can see that in the, the Theogony story, the relationship between tyranny and chaos, right, which is that, the revolution happens, and the only way to stop it is to eat your children. That's why revolution leads to tyranny all the time. Right? It's like Stalin, Lenin and Stalin say, oh, we don't need these, you know, these aristocrats or whatever. Get rid of them. We're in charge. And then all of a sudden, oh, now I have to kill all my friends. Now I have to kill everybody, because what is my legitimacy except for raw power right? and, and just raw capacity to impose it on others. And that's why, that's why the, weird, the weird aspect of what's going on is how this liberation narrative is becoming tyranny very fast. This strange, uh, this strange vision of how liberation ideas turn into tyrannical systems. But it's very coherent, right? It's very logical. There we go. All right. So, 
As artists, we have many artistic ideas for creations which grip us that never escape our minds to become manifest in the world. It seems to me that artistic ideas are given to us as gifts from a source outside of ourselves. But many of these worlds and images in our head that we find so profound and that move us end up becoming nothing. It reminds me of Dostoevsky dying before he could write the sequel to the Brothers Karamazov about Alyosha's life. Will that story never be written, or does it continue in heaven? So my question is, why are we given artistic ideas just for them to die? Mm -hmm. um, uh, hmm. Artists are very dangerous. Uh, Artists are very dangerous. There are reasons why Plato wanted to eject them from the Republic. Um, uh, because art is a, is, a, is, a secret, is a secret kind of capacity to um, capture meaning in a way that is very bright. You join things together, right? You, you, you gather stories together, you gather elements together in a manner that is very, very bright. Uh, but that's also how propaganda works. Propaganda also works that way. Because basically you can lie by gathering things together in a way that actually looks kind of bright. Um, so we have to be very cautious about, as artists, what it is that we are manifesting. You know, uh, because you're right. In some ways, most people that create art have a sense that what they're coagulating, like what they're bringing together, actually doesn't come from them, that they catch it. Right? It's like I, I catch it, and I, and I can bring it together. But the problem is that you can catch all kinds of things. You can catch all kinds of things that are rather destructive as well. And so I think that that's why the fathers you know, are very suspicious of imagination. They're very, very actually quite negative about, human, about imaginary things and imaginary worlds. Um, now, I don't think that I think that the testimony of the iconographic tradition, of the architecture, of, of the beauty of, the, of, the, of, of chants and music that's in the church shows us that, there's a, that it's not just that they're suspicious of the imagination, because look at all the beautiful things that the Christian civilization has produced. But I think we have to see it as we have to apply a certain spirit of discernment to the things that we catch um, when we're creating. Uh, and we also have to. We have to live virtuous lives. I hate, I hate that because it's really hard. But, <laughs> but like, we, we kind of have to live virtuous lives because we will attune ourselves to certain patterns. And those that are artistic and are capable of kind of catching them, uh, the, the, patterns they, the patterns that they catch will resonate with them. Like, so if you're living a completely discomp... This, there's a reason why punk rockers also do heroin, right? It's like, it's, it, there's a coherence to the, to the symbolism. Like, there's a coherence to, to how the types of patterns that we catch have to do with the way that we are, okay? So that's what I would suggest, is that if we want, first of all, to be vehicles for beauty and truth and goodness, then the only thing to do is to basically try to live that life uh, and then that will hopefully uh, will 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 catch. But in terms of the idea that that our ideas die, you know, and our art dies, I mean, thank God for that, because it's like that's also part of reality, right? It's like you want, you know, you don't want idols. You want things to. That's why for like traditional Christian societies are actually not bent on preserving things, by the way, that we think that, right? Because we have this weird idea of, of now how we preserve these old buildings and we, we all preserve them pristinely the way they were hundreds of years ago. Traditional Christians had nothing to do with that. It's like, they, oh, the church is too small? Just knock that wall down. Make it new, make it bigger, you know? It's like, oh, those, those frescoes are old. Let's paint over them. Like those, oh, we're, those, we have money to make mosaics? Okay, let's put mosaics over those frescoes. Because tradition is a living, breathing thing. You know, the, the icons of the ancient world were meant to die. 
And you venerate them until they're gone. And so I'm fine with, I mean, I don't want to complain that the fact that now in Moscow they've got Rublev's you know, thing behind glass and all. And I'm happy because we can see it. But that is not how the ancient Christians thought. Like, it's like the, the, the objects we make, they, they are not meant to be permanent. They have to be impermanent. And even the stories we tell, are, you know, we, we shouldn't be pining for immortality in the things that we do. Yeah. So brightness. And artists creating bright things. So you create bright things. Kind of a follow-up question. The, for you to choose to work on being an artist, you've created brightness that by you kind of following that letter around, picking up the letter, um, and your brightness being the way, brightness meaning your work of art, kind of the reason why that letter came to you. So you made a decision to make things and to be an artist, and now you're here. And you're shining pretty bright, and we're all paying attention. And I'm curious how it's been to, I guess, walk that path. Yeah, it's harder when people say things like that. <laughs> I mean, don't, don't blow my head up. That's, that's what I'm saying. Uh, Can you dunk? Yeah, I dunk. <laughs> um, well, okay, so I think, I think that for the, for the art part, I can just tell you how I, you know, how I approach it in the sense that one of the things that I think that one of the diseases of art that we've seen in the past few centuries is the idea of self-expression. I think that's a horrible thing. Uh, I think that we should always aim to express something that is not us, actually. We should always be uh, aiming to express things that are more than us. Uh, and, in, and so I would say that that's been my kind of guiding light, which is why that when I discovered iconography, I saw a powerful way to be able to make beautiful things in honor of something that is not me, in honor of something that, is, that has nothing to do with me, what well, has to do something with me than the fact that I participate in it. But you know, you know, I'll tell you, this is actually, uh, when I, because I studied contemporary art, and, uh, and I thought that's what I would do. I kind of got disillusioned, went away from that, started furiously studying iconography and, and icon language. And at some point, I had the chance the first commission I got was actually my bishop, Bishop Irenae. He asked me to make a panagia for him, so a pendant for a bishop. And I had never had a commission. It was my first commission. Uh, and so he said, could you make this miniature image of the mother of God? And so I'm like, OK, I'd never done it before. I'd never done a miniature. So I spent days and days working furiously at this thing. Um, and I was able to find a carver from Serbia who was giving me advice on how to do it. And I was really caught up in the process of making this object. And so when I finally finished it, I knew that the bishop was coming a certain Sunday to the parish. So I brought it to him, and I had it like wrapped in a little piece of, you know. I gave it to him, and I was just thinking, is he going to like it? You know, what is he going to think? Is it good enough? Did I do well enough? And he opened it up, and when he saw it, he, he bowed, and he crossed himself. And I was just floored. Like, I was like, wow, I couldn't believe it. And I thought, obviously he's not, he has nothing to do with me, right? He's seeing Mary, he's seeing the mother of God, and he recognizes her, and in recognizes her, he has this gesture of reverence towards her. I get to play a part in that. And the only thing that it costs me is, is that I have the credit for it. It's like, Phew. I'll take that deal. I'll take that deal anytime. It's like I get no. It's like the the, the the images that I make, they'll never be in museums. Like they'll never be collected by great collectors, or you know, it's like. But nobody kisses Picasso's paintings. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and the only thing that I the, to have access to that, all I need is to not take credit for it. And so it's like that's a deal for me. And so that's been my guiding light, is to basically say, it's like if I can express something, and the thing is, this is the weirdest thing, this is like the, in some ways like the dark secret, is that you'll always end up expressing yourself ultimately because you're the one making the thing. But if you aim to something more, 
right? Then people will still recognize that you made it, but it's like it'll play a secondary role in the whole thing. It'll be, it'll, it'll be like a secondary part of a, a greater participation. So I think that that's maybe a way for artists to think about it, to say, how can I manifest something higher? And the rest will, the rest will take care of itself, you know? So. Hello, Jonathan. Thank you so much for coming out, seeing us here on the West Coast. It's such a pleasure to have you with us. Um, my question for you has to do with a comment you made in a discussion with John Ravakey. And just to contextualize that conversation, John Ravakey had made a point about uh, ritual participation. And he used an analogy of different martial arts poses. He literally got up and struck these poses and talked about them as condensations of meaning, nexus of potential, and so on. And part of your response, you went on to take, make some comments about Christ. And specifically, you said something to the effect of Christ is Zeus, Christ is Dionysus. And um, I thought that was very interesting. So my question for you is, could you please expand on that point a little bit and clarify? I would also like to add that I found the YouTube clip so compelling. I shared it with some of my friends at my parish. And some of them got really upset. Mm. And you made a lot of trouble for me that day. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry. I got some, all kinds of trouble for you, man. So I'm just saying, I took some. So so come on, give me some, something, give me something. I took some heads of All right, okay. Well, thank you. That's, you. that's thank the main you. reason I'm here today is to just to say you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> thank you again so much. All right. Uh, and so, I mean, what I mean by that is, is, is I believe that, that Christ gathers all the stories in himself, and that Christ gathers all that which is good uh, in himself, all that which is true. And so in the, in the myths, in the ancient myths, what you often have are fragmentary truths, fragmentary aspects of reality that are held uh, and that are usually deviated from their ultimate purpose. But nonetheless, there's still something there that is shining. Because if it, if it, can I say that? If there wasn't anything shining, you wouldn't see it. Right? This is the thing about also understanding that the, all the, evil can only twist things that are true. Right? The evil has no capacity to create anything, anything on its own. You know? And it's the same with death, right? It can just kind of twist it and break it and things. And so what I mean by that is that all of the ancient myths that is revealing truth is contained in Christ. And so Christ contains, for example, like Christ has a Dionysian aspect to him. But Dionysus on his own is a dangerous, ecstatic figure that leads to madness and to drunkenness and to a kind of, you know, a kind of frenetic ecstasy. Now, Christ doesn't lead to that, but he does contain that in the sense that there is a Dionysian aspect to the Eucharist because I just want to remind you that we are eating the flesh and drinking the blood of our God. Like, that is not a normal thing. That is not something that we encounter all the time. It is, it is a very mysterious, ecstatic, and excessive symbolism. Now, it's not just that. The Eucharist contains all, you know, contains all of reality into it. But what I mean is that if we can, we can see fragmentary aspects of Christ in the stories of the ancient gods, um, and I think that that's the best way to see it. And not only that, but I think that honestly, that is the way the ancients saw it. That's the way the father saw it. That's the way St. Basil saw it. That's the way that, you know, that's why we still have those stories today, is because Christians maintain them. Christians are the ones that recopy the text. So if we have the, the tragedies, it's because Christians copied them, and they continued to tell them, and they would see them in the light of Christ rather than see them as just existing uh, on their own. Um, and it's the same for the, for, the, for the Iliad. It's the same for the Odyssey or the Aeneid or all these texts that were written in the ancient world. And so that's what I meant uh, in, that, in that sense. Hopefully that makes sense. Hello. <laughs> Okay, I have a lot of ideas that I'm going to try to formulate into a question. Wish me luck. <laughs> um, okay, so one of the things, I'm going to just reach back a little bit to the first section that you're talking about. Um, when we were trying to connect, or when we were connecting 
um, reason with meaning um, and kind of bridging that to this section a little bit. Um, when I think about God uh, being all-knowing or, you know, if, if, if you know everything, you don't really need to categorize, categorize things the same way that we might and you were touching on that when you were talking about the lizards, and if we knew every single particular lizard, we wouldn't necessarily need to, well, I think maybe that, maybe there's something going on there, where we might not, if you, if you knew every particular thing, you wouldn't need to categorize, maybe. Um, so I'm just wondering with this, this similar question with the reasoning and meaning, um, you know, it could be hypothetical, like, uh, depending on what you care about, or depending on what the person wants to do, they can find a, a different meaning mm -hmm. to, to what they were going to do. But but we don't want to say that anybody's meaning is objective or um, the same as God's meaning, mm -hmm. right? Um, so I guess I'm just kind of wondering, like, how do we know that our category, categories or meanings are the ones that are gods <laughs> and not just arbitrary ones. Yeah. Um, like, it's kind of connected maybe to the, to the Jungian kind of thing. Uh -huh. Like, are our concepts just in the human mind? Like, how do we... I'm not sure. Yeah, no, I, I, I think it's a, it, it is a difficult, because we, we're, we're not, it's difficult for us to perceive, because we, we are the conscious beings. It's difficult to kind of step out of our consciousness and look at our, our capacity to, to make meaning. Um, and so the way, the way to basically understand that is that there really is, there, really, there, is only th there are only things that are arbitrary to other purposes. You will never encounter something that is completely arbitrary. You actually can't. You, you can't see it. There's, you, you, so think about, uh, it's like, OK. So if, I, if, I, if I'm going to drink coffee, then all of a sudden there are aspects that become arbitrary to that, that are, that are kind of there. I can kind of see them in the periphery, but they're not related to the purpose. They kind of fall to the wayside, and I kind of drop them into the background. They kind of become background kind of information, OK? But the, you can never encounter chaos, absolute chaos. You only encounter relative chaos based on the purposes. And those purposes, the meanings, the, they're, they're never arbitrary. The thing that drives all the things we do are always coherent. They're always, you can't, you can't avoid meaning. You just cannot. They're always, they're always coherent. Does, does, sorry. Um, sorry, does that like make the meaning, the, yeah, it feels like it kind of has a, a problem or a hesitate, might have a hesitation. It's like if you call everything meaningful, does that make nothing meaningful? No, things are meaningful to their purposes, and those purposes have a meta, like there's a meta structure of purpose. So, right, so, it, so it, it's not, it's, it's really not, it's not, it's not, it's not woo. I, I'm always afraid that people think I'm making some weird, like, metaphysical thing. So, as if I'm drinking coffee again, right, there are, there's an indefinite amount of purposes happening at the same time. Right, so it's like, you know, my, my fingers are moving in a certain way. You know, everything, you know, the, 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 the paper has to have a certain consistency. The liquid has to have a certain temperature. There's all these purposes that are coming together. They're stacked into me drinking the coffee. But me drinking the coffee is also stacked in the fact that I don't want to fall asleep or that I'm thirsty. And that's stacked in... The me existing as a person and me loving my neighbor and that stat right so it, so the thing every purpose the purposes they they're all stacked together and you can you can go down the 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 hierarchy of purposes and you can break down all the gestures and all the micro things that you're doing into their micro purposes or you can or you can stack the goods up until you basically reach the infinite source of all things okay. And so that's the way to understand it. And so order and chaos, or heaven and earth, pattern and potential, 
you only experience them relative to the things that we're doing. Like heaven is not a category of existence. And earth in the Genesis 1 is not a category of existence per se. Things start to be exist when God unites heaven and earth in different ways. That's when things actually start to, to exist. Does that make sense? This is tough stuff to talk about. This is really difficult. <laughs> so you, you talked a bit about how in Genesis 1, God speaks, sees, and then evaluates. Um, now, if you read the text carefully, the only thing not explicitly called good is the firmament yeah. between the waters on the second day. Now, the firmament is the veil between heaven and earth, and it seems like it's necessary at this stage. It's there for a reason. God made it for a reason, but it's not called good. Um, now, the way I see it is, it's not. It's, it's good. not. Uh, it's not this. Fir uh, anyways, go ahead. It's not the firmament. Actually, it's. Wait, go ahead. Okay. Um, well, the way I see it is that it's not eschatological um, because it's meant to be torn. Um, yeah, and that's what we see in the Book of Revelation. So I'm just wondering if you can uh, maybe so correct me. It's difficult to tell you exactly what the reason for that is. By the way, in the Septuagint, it's all good. In the Septuagint. Uh, all the, all the days, but in the, the Hebrew text, there is that interesting exception, and it's really speculation on my part. This is nothing, like, don't take this as a, but it has to do with the separation of the waters more than the firmament, I think. Uh, the, it's very mysterious, the idea that there are waters above and there are waters below, and that those are separated. It's a very strange thing, and it, I think that there's a lot of there's actually some very deep uh, aspect to that uh, which relate some aspects of Christianity which have to do with the manner in which Christ transforms death into glory. There's, like a, there's, a, there's an aspect of non-being. It's the best good way to think about it. Because glory, glory is not you. That's hard to, th we don't think that way, but it's like glory is something that is coming from you that isn't you. It's like, it's the residue of you. It's like, that's why it's like your works, your legend, the things people say about you, that's what glory is. It's like this excess of being. It's not, it's actually not identity. And so that's why there's a weird relationship between glory and death. Because death is also when you stop being you, but in another way. It's like, it's when your identity breaks down and kind of falls apart. So there's a, there seems to be a very, very interesting mystery in the Bible where sometimes those two are put together, right? So when it says in the Psalms, it says that, that, uh, that the, 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 the old person's white hair is their glory. That's a really beautiful say. It's like, your dying is your beauty. It's, it's also beautiful because it's like white. It's like light coming out of your head, right? So it's like, oh, interesting. Um, and there are many places, and you can understand St. Paul, I think, in that way, where it's like, like you go under, you want, sometimes you want to tell St. Paul, it's like, well, which one is it, St. Paul? Right? Are works dead? Or do you have to run the race and get the crown? Which one is it? Right? Because the crown is that. That's a crown. A crown is not you. Crown is something that is added to you. It's something more than you. It's something that signifies you without being you, right? And so, but that's the mystery. It's as if in the right, in the right, um, in the right perspective, the works become your glory if they're offered to Christ. Maybe say it that way. If they're offered to Christ, they become glory. But if you try to hold on to them, then they become death. And it's really, I mean, it's really a really deep mystery because, um, you know, when we talk about the garments, you've heard, probably heard this, we, we have a tradition in the church which says that when Adam and Eve were in the garden, they had garments of glory, right? You probably, some of you, at least Orthodox, will have heard that, right? That's not, do you know where that comes from, where, where it says that we have garments of glory? In the first century, there was a rabbinical tradition that talked about these garments of glory, that the Adam and Eve had garments of glory in the garden. But where they got it from 
was the verse where it says that Adam and Eve have had garments of skin. Because the word skin, the way it could be interpreted in Hebrew, can be, if you take the vowels out and you just have the consonants, you can interpret it as glory or like skin, these dead skins. It's really interesting. It's like it's the same verse that is giving you both the idea that Adam and Eve have garments of glory and the idea that Adam and Eve are covered in death. I really think there's a mystery about Christ there. Because like, cause what is happening on the cross? Like, you know, what is this crown of thorns? Man, that'll crush you. Start thinking about that. Like, how is it that these extruded, these points, right? This, this, these extruded dead things that are like weapons that are the result of the fall, like how do they become a crown? And I think that's it. Like the, 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 I don't want to. I can't explain it, but I can see it in the story. It's like, ah. and so I think that's what martyrs are, right? I think that's what that's the call. But it's hard to totally understand it. But I think that's what the sep that's why there's an ambiguity about the separation of the waters in that text because there's something going on there that is very very mysterious about kind of a chaos above or an excess above and an excess below. That's my intuition, but I really, that's me. I don't take this as some kind of orthodox teaching. It's just me thinking about this for 20 years. <laughs> so, as orthodox Christians, in the process of gathering our thoughts and desires and ideas and actions and life experience into the reason and purpose of Christ, what is the role of prayer in that process? Mm -hmm. Well, okay, so I think that, first of all, it's important to separate the different uh, aspects of, of prayer to kind of understand, because there's worship, right? And that's probably easier to understand, at least from point of view of meaning, because we're we're attributing glory to the most high. Like we're basically saying, this is the highest thing. That's really what we're saying. We're saying, we're just saying it. We're, we're saying it in different ways. Like, this is, this is the, the, the glory to the Father, right? Glory to the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. It's like, what do we, we're, we're lifting up, like making as high as possible. And that's not that hard to understand, I think, because, you know, it basically creates the world. Not us, but I mean, Understanding that that which is the highest is affording body for us here below. It's making us capable of existing together. Um, the, the, inter, the intercessory aspect is, is more mysterious, I think. And it, I think that the intercessory aspect has to do with the role of Adam ultimately in the garden. Like that there's some way in which we participate in the way in which God reigns over reality. Like that, that, that we have some role to play. Uh, and it's mysterious in its causality, because obviously we're not bribing God. Like we're not, you know, we're not like, you know, we're not changing God's mind. You know, although there are some texts in scripture that seem to allude to that. But ultimately, it's more, there's an, it seems that we are the tools that God has created to kind of participate in that process. Uh, when, you look at the, when you look at prayers to saints, you, know, you can really see that beautiful structure in that, in that relationship you know, where we, we thank God for this saint that is appearing to us as an example, a concrete example of God acting in the world. Then we ask the saint to pray for us and then we thank God, or we even sometimes we ask God to save us through their prayers. Yeah. Right? Isn't that amazing? It's amazing because we're basically saying, no, we want this. Like, we want for, to recognize how we all participate in this amazing story. It's like, we, 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 we know that, God, you're the one who are saving us. But we find joy in knowing 
that the prayers we have for one another is actually the, the, the means by which this is happening. And there's this kind of, this joy, right, of being in a family where we all participate in each other's salvation. Um, so that's the way that I, I see that, yeah. Amen. <laughs> thank you for being here, Jonathan. Um, thank you, Holy Timothy, for hosting us. Uh, I'm definitely a stranger. We are strangers coming to nothing other places. It's been great. Um, I was going to ask about Saturn, but you got there already. Uh, so my question is similar to the one you had about um, Eagle and uh, Jung earlier, but relating to the work of René Girard. Um, I guess I'm looking for an orthodox perspective on Girard. Yeah. Uh, it does, does, you spoke about um, unity and chaos. Does that map onto uh, differentiation crisis? And, um, Say we spoke about Jung a little bit, and I wonder if a uh, an archaeological understanding of Christianity kind of combats the um, well, if it needs to be combated the uh, psychological therapeutic uh, way of the modern world. Yeah. Yeah. I, well, I, I do think that for sure Girard is a very powerful tool against re Jungian reduction of of the idea that these patterns are only inner psychic patterns. Because Girard clearly demonstrates how religious rituals and sacrifice is used to bind people together. And, and, and I, don't think that, I don't think anybody can doubt his conclusions in that sense. Um, my perspective on Girard, I'm not an expert on Girard in any way, but my, my perspective on Girard is that I think that he misses half the picture. And I think that he has a deep, he obviously has a deep understanding of scapegoat sacrifice and of how excluding the strange and the marginal and the exception creates unity and binds things together. That works. Like it's a, it's a, it actually, you know, you do it all the time, every time. It's actually, it's actually, it's also interpsychic. Like you, every time you define a category, even uh, intuitively in your mind, you're always excluding things that aren't part of that category, right? It's just, it's just how, how it works. Uh, but I think that Girard's account of sacrifice uh, doesn't account for sacrifice, all sacrifice. And I, a good way to understand it is the Yom Kippur, the Yom Kippur sacrifice, which is, interestingly enough, where he gets his scapegoat term. But the Yom Kippur sacrifice is two sacrifices. It's not one. There are two goats. And those two goats play two opposite roles. And I think that he understands the scapegoat part, which is basically the idea of putting all your deviance onto something and then excluding it. But he misses the, the, the purification in the sense of the offering up. Right? Because most sacrifices, especially in scripture, uh, the, the Thanksgiving sacrifices, they're actually offered up to God. They don't play the same role. And the Yom Kippur sacrifice is like that. So the, the goat that is offered up, right, you burn it. And you, the way you know it's offered up is you burn it. You burn it, the smoke goes up. I know it sounds so superstitious, but really, you, you just have to get into the experience of seeing something being burnt and the smoke rising up into heaven. You know, that's the offering up. And then the blood of that goat covers and cleans. It's so funny because we, we, you know, I grew up a Protestant and we had all these hymns, you know, like I'm cleaned in the blood of the lamb. And it's like, dude, the blood doesn't clean. Like blood doesn't clean, not like water. Like it's a, it's a different kind of cleaning because you put blood on something, it covers it, right? It, it, it actually covers it in the, in the substance. And so that idea of offering up so that we're covered in something that makes us one, that's the other aspect of, of sacrifice. And I think that the, the Christ on the cross is both. And if you just see the scapegoat sacrifice, you're totally missing out that Christ is both goats, that he's not just one. He, he, he's, doing, he's doing both at the same time. Uh, you know, and so I think that that's the one thing that Gerard maybe is missing, and that's why I think that Gerard declared the end of the sacred, like he says that Christianity 
that Christ eliminates the sacred. It's like, well, that's just, just patently false. And obviously not. It's like, come to church with me tomorrow, <laughs> Gerard. Like, what are you, what are you talking about? Like, I, he's, even, he's even Catholic, so I don't understand how he justified it in his mind. Uh, anyway, so that's what I think, you know. Uh, I think that, I, I think that, someone told me that, I, I didn't, I haven't read his later work, but someone told me at the end of his life that he, he was, he started to talk about self-sacrifice, uh, you know, as a, a way in which the sacred still participates in our reality, and I think that maybe he was on to the, the key that it was missing. Almost lost all of you at the last uh, last part of the talk. <laughs> Might have lost myself there for a moment. But after lunch, it's always rough. All right, and so I I'm gonna start I'm gonna start this talk with with com something completely different. Uh, I want to tell you the story of Jack and the Beanstalk. Uh, you know, because I, I hopefully you can see that these 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 patterns that I'm talking to you about they they. They don't, the gospel story and the story of scripture is the highest, most powerful version of them, but they actually are everywhere. It's just, it's just the pattern of, of uh, the pattern of scripture is the pattern of experience. And so, sorry? Um, I was like, what's going on? Um, uh, and yeah, so, so, so uh, as some of you know, you know, I started publishing some fairy tales. We published Snow White just last year, and I'm, we're working now on Jack and the Beanstalk. And so I'm thinking a lot about Jack and the Beanstalk. Jack and the Beanstalk is a story that when I was young really fascinated me and bothered me because there was something clearly amoral about that story, right? It's like, you know, they tell you that fairy tales are morality tales. I don't think so. There's something else going on. Um, and so I've been thinking about Jack for 20 years uh, because of that, more than that, you know, 40 years, I guess now. <laughs> um, and so let me tell you the story of Jack and the Meat Sock. So uh, I try to think of some of, the, some of the categories of scripture as I tell it, just to, just to realize that some of these categories are, are similar. Okay, so what's important is that Jack is poor. And Jack doesn't have a father. You know, he lives with, with his mother. He does not have a father, and, and he's poor. Um, and he's running out of body, right? They're running out of food. They don't have the resources needed. And so Jack's mother tells Jack to go and sell the last thing they have, which is the family cow, right? And so... Go sell the cow, we'll have a bit of money, basically we'll, we'll make some food and we'll die. You know, it's, it's one of those, uh, pretty much, uh, which you see in the story of the widow of Elijah also. It's like, we, we have nothing. Like we, have, we have nothing, let's just do this last thing and then that'll be it for us. We'll run out of, we'll run out of body, run out of identity, we won't have anything left. So Jack goes out and he meets this strange fellow. And the fellow, says, well, I would like to buy your cow, but I've got these magic beans. And you know, I would like to trade your cow for magic beans. Uh, why would anybody trade a cow for beans? This is something I've just been thinking about forever. <laughs> so is, it, is, it, is it just a trick, right? So is it just a trick that's being played on Jack? Maybe, but is there something else going on? Right. Why is it that he would want to trade this cow that makes milk for seed? Right. Because Jack doesn't have, that's what he's missing. Right. He doesn't have a father. He doesn't have an identity. He's missing seed. That's what he's missing. And so Obviously, he doesn't totally understand this, but it's like, okay, this is actually what I'm, I'm missing. There's something about seed that I need, you know, in order to get to the next level. I need to get out of this problem, which is that I'm down here at the bottom of the earth, 
and I'm lacking something from above. Okay. So this little seed, right? It's not like a mustard seed, but it's a bean, you know, but still, it's a little seed. He gets that seed. Uh, then he goes back to his home and he tells his mother, I sold the cow for seeds. And obviously she is like, what? What? Why would you do that? She can't see the value of the seed because it's too, what is it? It's a little thing. What are we going to do? We're going to eat the seed and then we're done. We're going to die. Like what, what's the point of this little seed, right? So the rest of the story seems to be figuring out what seed is about. Like what is this? You know, and, and a seed is, a, it's as close to heaven as you can get on earth. I mean, that's the best way to understand it. Because it's something that has almost no body, but it has the pattern in it somehow. It has a pattern inside that if it comes into contact with body, then it produces something. It's pretty amazing, right? Because it... It's nothing. It's like it, 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 it doesn't seem to have value. So how do we figure out what the, what the value is? So the mother tosses the seed away because it's not valuable. She can't see the value in it. But then what the seed creates is a ladder. The seed produces a ladder between heaven and earth. Well, that's interesting, right? That's an interesting idea. Uh, and so this beanstalk appears, and it goes all the way up into heaven. So Jack says, well, right, I'm going to climb the beanstalk, and I'm going to go up and see what I can find there. So Jack climbs the beanstalk, and he encounters a giant. And this is, this, the, why he encounters a giant is something that's just been also bothering me forever. And someone, I think it was, yeah, he said, he said, why are the giants up there? Why aren't they down here, right? And this is because, in this case, the giant is an obstacle. He's, he's like, a, he's like a, a principality that's stopping Jack from getting the highest thing at this point. So Jack encounters the giant, and then the first thing that he gets, right, the first thing that he steals from the giant is gold, usually. He gets a bag of gold, comes back down, and then he brings it to his mother, and it's like, woo, all right, we're done, we're, we've got it, we've got, we've got value. But there's a problem, right, because the gold runs out. Huh, well, that's interesting. So the gold runs out. So there's got to be something more than that. So what's more than gold? Right, the thing that makes gold. Right, how do you, if you know how to get gold, then you've got something more than gold, right? So Jack goes back up, and he encounters this giant again. And now the giant has this chicken that lays golden eggs. It's like, huh. That's a higher pattern than the one I had before, right? It's like, at first I got the seed. It's like, what is this? Some intuition about a pattern. Then I go up. Then I encounter the first part, which is I get a sense of the value. But then higher up still is if I can have the thing that creates value, huh then I've got a higher pattern still. So he steals the chicken that makes the golden eggs. And he brings it back down to his mother. Now, this is the part yeah, that, to me, is the most interesting part of the story of Jack, because you think that, that he's, pretty, he's good to go now. He's basically got a chicken that produces golden eggs. He, you know, he's good, for, he's good to go for, you know, you can just keep producing gold and Things will be fine, and he'll have a comfortable life, and his mother will have a comfortable life. Mm. But it seems there's something else missing. Uh, and so he still feels like there's something else. Like there's something that he doesn't, he doesn't quite get about how these patterns kind of lay themselves out, and how these purposes lay themselves out. So he goes back up, 
And then he encounters this harp, that golden harp that plays music on its own. Right? That's a weird thing. How do you get, you get a seed, gold, then you get a chicken that lays golden eggs, but now why is it a harp? And I mean, that's when you realize that that's what the story is about. He encounters the pattern itself. Right? That's what music is. Music is a pattern. That's why we talk about the music of the spheres, right? That's why the ancients had this idea that the cosmos makes music. It doesn't mean that the spheres rub against each other and, and make music. I mean, yeah, you could kind of... Want it. It's a nice analogy or a nice metaphor to understand it, but it means that these patterns, the cosmos has a pattern to it. And if you, can, if you can capture the pattern of everything, then everything else lays itself out below. It's the cause of the other things. So you can understand it as now levels of causality. So he finds this mysterious seed at the bottom. And then value is the cause of that. That which produces value is the cause of that. And then at the end, he gets the music itself. He gets the pattern itself. And that's the last thing that he gets from the giant. In some ways, it's like a jump. It's like this weird thing that is more than, than uh, just physical value or whatever. Okay, um, And so of course, Jack comes back down, and then he cuts the beanstalk, and all the giants fall and die. He's eliminated the obstacles to the thing, to the pattern above. So it's a, you know, it, it, there's a, there's a, it's, it's a weird amoral story, and there's aspects of it that are kind of gray. It's, it's not as pure, obviously, as the stories that you find in scripture, but, Nonetheless, that pattern right, is very similar to the pattern of Moses who goes up the mountain. Right? So Moses sees this thing. He sees this burning bush. It's like, you know, what is this? You know, what, what is this going to lead me to? It's very mysterious at the outset. You know, or you could talk about when Christ talks about finding the pearl in the field, right? And when Christ talks about the, 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 the little seed that, or even the fish in the water, right? These shiny things at the bottom of the world that kind of spark you and make you think, oh, there's actually more. There's something more to this world than just the boring causality. Some things are brighter, right? Some things are shining. And so Moses sees the the, the, the burning bush, and that ultimately leads him up the mountain. Right? Going up the mountain, going up a beanstalk, it's the same basic structure. And he goes up the mountain, and if you've never read St. Gregory of Nyssa's Life of Moses, it's amazing, because he really helps us see the meaning of these things. And you know, I told you about how when Adam comes down the mountain, he accumulates these exteriorities, right? He accumulates these garments of skin and civilization and, and all these, these things that we add to ourselves, whether it's your car or whatever, or you know, all these things, our jobs, all these things that get kind of, we pad around ourselves to kind of make us survive in a world that's, that we see as dangerous to us. Well, Moses goes up and he eliminates those, right? He removes the garments of skin. When he sees the, the, the burning bush, he removes his sandals to kind of come into contact with the burning bush. But as he's going up the mountain in the text, in Exodus, it's actually really powerful because he goes up with the elders of Israel and then the elders at some point stay at a certain level. And then Moses goes up with Joshua and, and uh, I think, is it Joshua? I forget who the other person is, sorry. He goes up with two other people and then he leaves them there. And then he, well, sorry, Joshua and Aaron. It's like, how could I forget that? He goes up with Joshua and Aaron, and then he leaves them, and then he goes up alone to the top of the mountain. And what does he get there? What does Moses get at the top of the mountain? He gets the law. Now, what is the law? The law is a pattern. 
That's what the law is. And if, and if you're not sure that the law is a pattern, right after God gives Moses the law, he gives him an actual pattern for a building. He says, here's the plan for the tabernacle. Here's an here's a actual pattern, description, of a building that you're going to build at the bottom of the mountain that will be an instantiation of what you encountered at the top of the mountain. He says, here up in the, in the mountain, you are encountering something ineffable, something that's one, something that is completely, you know, that is incapable of fully being expressed. But I will give you a pattern that you can now build at the bottom of the mountain that will manifest the, the, the invisible pattern at the top. Right? So you can see that this structure right, going up, and getting the pattern, right, and then bringing the pattern down the mountain, that is, once you start to see it in scripture, you'll see that it's there. It's constantly there. Right? It, it just repeats itself over and over. Um, in the story of Moses, what's interesting is that at first, the pattern that God gives Moses, it doesn't land. So. You know when I talked about how when heaven and earth separate? At the beginning I mentioned that. Like when heaven and earth separate, when things something goes up and then down below things get chaotic and then up above, right? That happens in the story of Moses, by the way. Because as Moses is going up the mountain to encounter God, the people down here, they're getting crazy, right? And they make an idol and they start to fornicate and everything gets really wild. You know, and then when Moses comes back down, the pattern and the the people and the world don't fit, and so uh, Moses breaks the tablet. There's interesting traditions about that because the first tablets it says that God made the tablets and God wrote on the tablet with his finger, and then the second tablet it's Moses that makes the tablet and writes down the law. There's this kind of idea that in some ways the first law, the people were too low and the law was too high, it didn't fit. We had to accommodate, kind of come a little lower so that things would actually uh, meet in the, you know, at the, there's a interesting Jewish traditions about how the first tablets were made of some precious stone, like you know, some, some, some translucent uh, stone and that it was too high and that we had to kind of adjust it to, that's why when we represent it now, it's like kind of granite, these, these like uh, heavier stones. Um, so you see this pattern like all through scripture. Now, there's something really scary about the pattern that I'm telling you about, if you've noticed it, which is that if I talk about identity and I say, here's the identity and here's where identity breaks down, and here's the stranger, and here's the strange stuff, and here's the monsters on the edge. You know, that can lead to some pretty scary stuff, right? And you can understand how that's how war functions, right? It's like, I have my identity, you know, and then they have their identity. We don't recognize each other, and then we fight. Uh, and so there's a problem with identity, like a really central problem with identity. In some ways, it's inevitable. We actually can't escape it, but there's also a problem with it, which is that it leads to the, the very question of inside and outside. Like, there's, some things, there's some people inside, and there's some people outside. And you can see that in the, in the, the, even in the way that the law is given to Moses and the pattern of the tabernacle, we'll make use of that structure. You want to come to the tabernacle? You want to come to the temple? You have to be pure. You have to be circumcised. You have to have done these different things which mark you as being on the inside. And if you don't have that, then you are on the outside. You don't have access to the inside. So it's a tricky it's, it's tricky. You got, I imagine you can see how it's, it's tricky and that it can become dangerous, although we have the problem of it being inevitable. So 
What's interesting is all of this seems to be ultimately leading to, to Christ. And Christ, he, he both reveals how this all comes together and kind of shatters it at the same time, kind of breaks it all. He kind of reveals something more about how identity works. And you'll see it in his story. The, in the story of Christ, what you're always seeing, almost all the time in the story, is someone going coming down a mountain. That's pretty much all the time what you're seeing. You're seeing someone who's at the top of the mountain coming down the mountain. And that's why the story looks the way that it does. Think about when I talked I talk at the outset about Christ walking on the water and St. Peter uh, coming out of the boat. You have to remember that just before Christ walks on the water, do you know what he does? I already told you. He goes up a mountain. He goes up a mountain to pray, and then he sends the disciples out on a boat on the water. Think of that as that big cosmic image that I'm telling you about. Think about as Christ goes up to paradise, and he sends the disciple out on the ark, on the flood. Right? There are different ways you can picture it in your mind. It's basically an image of, of everything, an image of reality, right? Out there, there's the waters, there's the chaos, and he sends his disciples out on that chaos, and he goes up on the boat, on the, he goes up the mountain, right? And so, it's super interesting, actually, because then he comes down the mountain, and he walks on the water. And when he's walking on the water, do you remember what they see at first? They see a ghost. They, they see something that's not quite embodied. That's the sense that they have. Right? Because why? Because it's coming down the mountain. It's coming from heaven. It's coming from heaven, and it's appearing to them as something which is not quite embodied. But of course, the surprise is that it is, ultimately. It does. Christ is embodied. Christ is not a ghost. But then Christ comes down the mountain, and he masters the chaos. Uh, and it's really beautiful because St. Ephraim, in his poem on the hymns on paradise, he, in, in one of the stanzas, he says, even when he's talking about the first image of the whole mountain and the waters of chaos on the edge, he says, the holy ones descend the mountain and walk on the waters, even from the outset, even, let's say, in the vision of Adam himself. Because... That's actually the surprise, is that Christ is showing how all things can participate in the, in, in the whole structure. And that for the one who is at the top of the mountain, the stranger, the marginal one, the, the, the one that doesn't fit, is not a threat, actually. It's actually a surprising encounter with transformation. And so Christ comes down the mountain, walks on the waters. Christ comes down the mountain and, 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 and uh, encounters the Canaanite woman. That story about the Canaanite woman is also all about that. Because what is it that happens in that story? It's really powerful. Right? Christ is there, and the Canaanite woman comes, you know, and she asks Christ. Christ says, you know, he, he calls her a dog. It's crazy. He calls her a dog. You know what that means in terms of identity, right? You've heard that. You've heard people do talk that way about people that aren't of my tribe, you know? And the word barbarian comes from that term, by the way. That's the way many scholars understand barbarian is basically like they bark like dogs. They don't have meaningful speech. And that's why we say they're bar, 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 right? But then Christ ultimately actually concedes to, to the Canaanite woman. It's important that, that she's Canaanite also, by the way, because in the whole story of Scripture, she's, she really is a descendant of the, the fallen ones in the story of Noah, right? She's a descendant of Ham. She's a descendant of the, the, the Rephaim, too, like these weird giants that are in the, the, these kind of monstrous things. Like That's what it's hinting at in the story. But Christ is constantly doing that. 
uh, you know, where it's the centurion. And that's also what healing the sick is, by the way. It's that surprise. Because this beautiful story that Christ says when, he, when someone asks him about the, the person that is born blind and says, why is this person born blind? What is the sin that causes this person to be born blind? Right? Because think about the structure that I gave you at the outset. It makes total sense. It's like there's something defective. If there's something defective, it means that it is not aimed towards the purpose. And therefore, it is a consequence of sin. So the question they're asking isn't that weird. They're saying, if this person is defective in some way, what is the sin that has caused this? What is the misalignment? What is the lack of purpose? What is the, 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 the misalignment towards purpose that has caused this? And that's where Christ surprises everybody and basically does the move that I can't explain, but it has to do with your question. It has to do with this weird idea that there's a relationship between death and glory. That in fact, our, the manner in which we have, how can I say this? The manner in which, in which we are actually broken can become a kind of opening for the glory of God to shine. Right? That the manner in which we are defective can become a, a, a potential for a treasure to be discovered. It's like, that's amazing. That transformed everything. Right? It's like all of a sudden, it's not that the first image, right, the image of the hierarchy and the image of the purpose and the image of meaning, it's not that that disappears so much. It's not that it goes away. But it shows us how, in fact, ultimately all things can participate in the glory. And that the manner in which, and that death itself can become an opportunity, like a, like a crack or something, like, so, like a broken thing for light to, to, to shine through. Um, and that's really, in some ways, the mystery of what Christ does, because you know, he, he takes the very structure that I told you about in the outset, but he makes it complete. And, and it's not just a, it's not just a, it's not just a cope, right? It's it's actually not a cope. It's actually how reality works. Now we'll we'll, we'll do this now, okay? So you know we talked about the, the question of identity or the question of purpose, right? Now there's something about purpose, like there's a fire that purpose to get out of here appears as bright, okay? And But there's a danger, again, in these purposes, which is that they can, they can grab us, they can become little tyrants, they can become idols. And then you realize that actually the world functions through a form of self-sacrifice, that that's actually how reality works which is that for any purpose to exist, it has to give itself up for something more. It has to, or else it actually can't exist. So this is, a, and this is, this is not just a moral question, although it is a moral question, but it's not just a moral question, it's actually, it's actually how things work. So right, for a steering wheel to exist, it has to give itself to the purpose of the car. But there's no point in having some fetishized steering wheel that you hang up on the wall. What is that going to do? It has no reality. The only reality that the steering wheel has is to the extent that it gives itself to a higher purpose. Right? And that's actually what makes it bright. It's actually what makes it shine. If you try to capture it completely and cut it off from its higher participation, it dies. It just becomes nothing. And so the, the mysterious surprise of the Messiah, right, is that the king, right, the top of the pyramid, the one with the crown, the, 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 the powerful one at the top, can only be that if he gives himself. 
And that without that, it doesn't work. Without that, it shatters. Without that, it becomes like this, this self-devouring uh, thing that, that breaks down. And when you think about it, you realize that that's actually, again, how things work. Like, actually, even, the, even like, think about <clears throat> our sports heroes, for example. It's a great example. It's like we have this idea. This is actually one of the examples that, you know, you think like, okay, so you've got Michael Jordan, you know, who is this shining bright sports player who like shows us what's possible in basketball and does this amazing thing, or any type of uh, player that plays in a, in, a, in a sports team. It's like it's amazing, it's astounding, but the reality is that that top player, right, cannot keep the glory completely for themselves. They can't. They can try sometimes. But they can't. If they do, they lose. Right? If a player in the team tries to do everything themselves and get all the glory for themselves, their team will lose. And so they actually have to give themselves. They have to give themselves to the, to the thing they're doing, to a higher purpose, and they also have to give themselves to the people that are constituting the team that they're in or the body that they participate in. And that's what you realize then, that actually, this is how leadership has always worked. It's actually always been that way. And the great leaders, ultimately, you realize that they actually have a little bit of seed of, of Christ in them. That they're actually, they have to do it, even if they don't know what they're doing. They ultimately have to give themselves to something higher. And they have to also give themselves to the people that are constituting their nation or their body, or else it doesn't work, or else it all shatters. And even, and even the one that we use as an example at the outset as the, as the contrapposto to Christ, uh, Augustus, it's really interesting to see how Augustus maintained his power. He was the first emperor. It's really complicated. Do you know how he maintained his power? He gave all his power away. That's how he did it. The only way that he could stay emperor is that all the honors and the powers that were given to Augustus, he basically said he didn't want them. And he gave them away. And by doing that, he became the most powerful in the empire. And he kind of, he weirdly, secretly maintained all his authority and all his power and by giving it away. He would walk around, you know, uh, and he didn't wear any special dress. He, he, he always would kind of evacuate that power, and that's one of the reasons that made him a powerful emperor. And if you look at the stories of the great Roman emperors, you'll see that's how they're characterized. You know, even the ones that hated Christians, like even the ones that were horribly evil, the moments that shine as being their strong points, you'll see, oh, wait a minute, there's a weird Christological thing happening. Right? You know the story of Trajan, right? I don't know if you guys know the story. So it's like Trajan is is going down, he's going on campaign, he's with his army and he's really powerful. And this, this old woman comes up to Trajan and says, and asks the emperor for a favor. And Trajan's like, I'm too busy, I don't have time for this. You know, I'm just, I just, I'm, I'm going to war, like this is a huge thing. And the woman says, you know, if you don't have time basically for your people, then why are you the emperor? And so Trajan stops the whole army and listens to this woman's petition and takes the time to answer her petition, and this is told as a story of great of the great glory of Trajan, right? And this is this is not a Christian emperor at all. But what I mean is that if you then if you go back even into the pagan stories and you find those moments that shine the brightest, you'll see a surprise that it's actually refracting some light of Christ and the the secret that Christ has revealed, which is that identity is canonic, that identity must empty itself or else it doesn't hold. It seems like a paradox, but like I, like I, I tried to show you, it's actually, it is actually how the world works. You know? Without that, then things crystallize, they, 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 they become too solid and they, they shatter. You know? And you can see it. Any time any group, any organization becomes too self-concerned, right? Do, too concerned with their own needs and stops and forgets how they serve a higher purpose, 
it's, it's over, right? It pretty much, that's what we call corruption. Right? That corruption is when smaller goods try to capture the organizations and try to, to keep things for themselves. Um, so if you look at the story of Christ, you'll see that he's constantly revealing that. And then the, the image of the crucifixion, of course, is the highest, you know, the, the image that breaks everything. Right? It breaks everything, but it also is the source of reality. And so when, when St. Maximus says that when Christ is on the cross, he's creating the world, it's not, like, it's, not just a, it's not just a nice thing that we say. It's not just something that sounds really you know, spiritual and religious. This is, Christ is actually revealing the man in which reality works and the, the deep paradox of him on the cross, which is that when he is on the cross, he is not just at the top of the mountain, but he's filling the entire mountain with himself. He's filling the entire structure with his presence. So it's a weird paradox. You'd think that when you get to the top of the mountain, you just have this glorious light thing. But the surprise is that when you get to the top of the mountain, it seems that you have something which both is at the top and is crowned and is called king, but also is at the same time emptying itself and filling up the entire world with, with that that, that gift. Um, and so that's why the, well, it's, not, it's not why, but it's definitely one of the reasons why the, the, the crucifixion is so weird and so mysterious because, you know, it's like Christ is being treated as a criminal, but then ironically, he's being called a king, right? They put a crown on him and they, they put a vest, like a purple uh, vestment on him and they, they call him the king, and they're doing it in irony, but secretly, they're doing it for real, without them even knowing that's what they're doing. So without knowing that they're actually recognizing the creator of the world and the king of, of the world, they're doing it nonetheless. You know? And the same when Christ is on the cross. You know, it's like they put a sign above his head that says he's the king out of irony, but ultimately it is telling the truth in a very, in a very mysterious way, in a way that empties itself and kind of fills, fills the world. Um, so that is the, how can I say, that is the, the solution in some ways to the problem of identity. And you see it, in the Old Testament you have this image, right, of the, of the son of man, and it's a, it's a very important image to understand how meaning functions because you have this image of someone like a man in the divine, you know, sitting on a throne next to God. So the fact that he's sitting is kind of revealing that he's not an angel, that he's not someone who's in service to God. He's sitting on a throne. So it means that he's akin, he's at least akin to God. That's you can't avoid it. And even the early Jews, the Jews of the uh, early first centuries, they, they, they actually were trying to deal with that problem of this vision of the, of the Son of Man. And so, of course, the, the people expected when the Son of Man comes, what will he look like? He'll be this glorious king, this glorious figure that'll come and conquer things and take over the Roman Empire and basically, you know, you know, Basically, you know, yeah, yeah, take over the Roman Empire. That was the hope that they had. And the mystery is that, you know what, it's, and by the way, this is also a thing that's annoying. It's like if you, with like religious professors, when they tell you that all, they were expecting uh, the Messiah to come and take over the Roman Empire, but it didn't happen, so they coped, and they made him into this resurrecting, you know, thing or whatever. It's like, Christ did take over the Roman Empire. I'm sorry to tell you, but he really did. You know, just because it took 300 years doesn't mean that he didn't take over the Roman Empire. Like, he actually did, but he did it in that mysterious way where in emptying himself and giving himself and not raising himself up, he was raised up, and it did happen, and he did take over identity. He did, and so that is the, that is the weird 
surprise about how for Christians identity works. You know, and you and it's very mysterious because it and it's really hard because it's annoying to think, oh, so I have to die. Okay, yeah, that's annoying. But you can see it, you know, you can see there's an amazing story. You probably have heard the story before of how this the, the story of how the uh, the games in Rome, how the, the gladiatorial fights ended. And I'm sorry, and I hope he forgives me. I, I forget the name of the saint. Hopefully <laughs> that'll be okay. Uh, and so the, 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 even when the Christians were there, the gladiatorial fight still continued. And then one day, a Christian went into the arena and stepped in between the gladiators and said, stop in the name of Christ. And they killed him. And then everybody left the stadium. And then that was it. No more gladiatorial fights. There, that was the end of the, of, the, of the games. It's like, that's a very mysterious image, right? That's a very mysterious image of how transformation happened and how identity can happen without opposition, of how we can, we can have shining bright identities that aren't posited in opposition to a kind of you know, horrible outside. It's a transformation from the inside. And in some ways, it really, is the, it really is the only way for true transformation to happen. You know, and in some ways, you know, that's it. It's like, how did Christians take over the empire? Well, they didn't fight anybody. They didn't start an army. They didn't start a political party. They basically lived like Christ in a self-sacrificial way. And those seeds grew up into you know, the Holy Roman Empire for all its faults was still a crazy thing that happened that the emperor would convert and that all of Rome would ultimately convert to, to Christ. And then what you see in the last image in the book of Revelation, you see that all kind of coming together in this powerful image where we have the Son of Man that is above this, the great city but you also have the lamb that was sacrificed before the foundation of the world. And there's a way in which those two are the same, right? It's like, and one is the other, one can be the other, right? The reason why we, we can recognize the Son of Man as this bright, glorious figure without danger is because he is also the lamb that gave himself and emptied himself out. Like, that's pretty, that's actually, like, it really is a great way to deal with the problem of identity. And you can see, because we need the hierarchies, right? We, we can't live without hierarchies. We can't live without shining examples, shining stars, without leaders. But that image of how, you know, and you know that in our tradition, right, the best bishops are always the bishops that don't want to be bishops, right? They're always the monk that doesn't want to be a bishop. And they have to like go into the desert. They drag him out of the desert. They put him on a throne. They say, you're the bishop. And then he runs away. And they go back and they get him. And they say, you're the bishop. And you always know that that ends up being the best bishop. Why? Because he actually doesn't want power. And that the fact that he, that he doesn't want it becomes the reason why he should have it. Super interesting. Makes, makes democracy complicated, though. <laughs> It's democracy complicated, but you know, you, it, it, to understand like how how that functions in terms of how it does solve the the, the question of identity, um, and just to finish, and what that does for us as Christians, it's super interesting to see how it plays out liturgically in the way that we worship and the way that we set up our our worship. You know, often people talk about how the the church is a continuation of the temple. And there's a way in which that's true. The structure, like the, tripart structure, the tripartite structure of the temple and the tabernacle is repeated in the church. We have the holiest place. We have the court, which is the nave, right? And then we, well, actually, we have the holy place. And then we have the, the court, which actually presses the narthex. We have this, like, three-part structure that is the, the same as what we see in the Old Testament, but... Uh, in, the, in the Old Testament, the Holy of Holies has the Ark of the Covenant. And then in the court, you have the altar. And in the, on the altar, you offer up the sacrifice. And then in the Holy of Holies, the glory of God descends. So you can imagine it like you give the sacrifice, 
and then in the secret place, the holy, the holy uh, presence descends onto the, on the Ark of the Covenant. But that's not how it is for us. That's not how it is for Christians. We've collapsed the Ark of the Covenant and the altar together. Right? That it's in fact one and the other are the same because it is because of the sacrifice and the self-giving that the glory of God descends. Those two are this mysterious surprise that they're actually the same. And so in the holy place in the, in the church, you have something, a table, altar, ark. It's all, it's, it's all fused into one, one, one place. Uh, and that's, that's ultimately the mystery that Christianity brings about. And it's the surprise, in some ways, the surprise of identity, which once, when it appears at first, it doesn't make sense. It seems weird and like, okay, so why is this dying? Why would someone dying be the source of reality? Why is it that these martyrs that die, why do they transform Rome? But once you start to see it, you realize that that's how it's been all along. That's always how it's been. It's just that it was fully revealed in the incarnation as being really the manner in which, in which the world exists. So, so hopefully that brings it all together for you. Thank you for your time. This has been wonderful. And uh, I'm, I'm willing to take more questions if, if you want. Thank you for stretching our minds open. This morning, um, you mentioned the word uh, uh, diversity, and you said the counterbalance to that was uh, unity. Uh, everywhere in our society, in, in government, in education, and in, uh, uh, um, even in corporations, this diversity, inclusion, and equity has been pushed with great vigor. It, it sounds very noble, but it ends up being very tyrannical. Um, what would be your counter words for uh, inclusion and equity? Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So let, let's take. It's interesting to take the three together and, and kind of see what what it does if you make those into a god. Uh, that's the good way to think. If you if you think that diversity, equity, and inclusion is the highest principle by which to align all your society. You know, you can see what, what it does. Uh, and it's not that those things, diversity, equity, and inclusion, are bad. They're good. We, we deal with them. We have to deal with these questions all the time. They're part of the goods that we juggle and that we join together in order to, to, live, to live together. But when we take them and we prop them up, and we make them into these things that shine, you know, uh, they, uh, they really destroy the world. <laughs> I don't know what to say. They actually destroy things. They, 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 they collapse the, the, the reality because, so think about, think about again, uh, a basketball team, right? So you have a basketball team. The basketball team has a purpose to play basketball, win basketball games. You know, that might be, uh, not a very important purpose in the world, but we can still recognize that that's the purpose, and that's the reason why the basketball team exists. You know, you might like it or not, but you know that that's why they're there, that's why they're playing, and that's and all the rules are geared towards that. So then, let's say you take that basketball team, and you say, no, 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 no. The purpose of the basketball team is diversity, equity, and inclusion. So what happens? It's over. It's finished. You can't, you, can't, you can't have those two at the same time. Because a basketball team necessarily has to have ways to judge whether or not the people involved in the sport are attaining the purpose of the sport. So if you make inclusion the purpose, then all of a sudden, how do you know who's in or not? Or not? Because you actually are destroying the identity itself. You're, 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 it's being eaten. It's being devoured. And that's true for anything, anything in the world. 
right? Any company, like a company's making robots or making things, if you make diversity, equity, and inclusion the, the highest star of that company, you will, it'll, it'll eat it up, it'll devour it, because you're making decisions based on something else besides the purpose of, of, the, of, the, of, the, thing, of the thing that exists. You know, and so it's very pernicious because this is, this is the problem of a lot of, a lot of modern thinking is that we, we think in oppositions. So we think, oh, so you're saying you don't want diversity and inclusion? Is that what you're saying, right? And everybody just freaks out. Everybody's like, oh, no, 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 no. Of course, of course I want diversity and inclusion and equity, right? And so, but the, the reality is that you, you, those need to be in balance with the purpose and the reason why the thing exists in the first place, the identity of the thing. And so then there, there has to be diversity. There is no unity without diversity. You know, unities are made of diversities. That's actually how it works. You have something that's one, and then you realize that it's made of many things. Those many things come together into the one, and then the one gives itself to the many. It's like that's how it actually functions. But if you just have one, and you just have the other, you have death. And the trick that people are playing now is that they want to make you think that one is exclusion, one, the two are separate. If you want unity, it means that you're against diversity. So that's cogwash. Because unity is made of diversity. So it's like we have to be able to just think differently and not let ourselves be taken up by the, by the, 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 the trick. It really is a trick that is being played on us when, when there's this push towards these, these kinds of questions. You know, and uh, it's like if, if it's hard for people to understand um, you know, in terms of politics because it, it makes us feel uncomfortable, you know, just think of it in terms of your family. Right? Just think of your family and think of how the diversity of the people in your family make up the unity of the family. But only if they're aimed towards the same things. If everybody in the family is just doing whatever they want, and there's no commonality, and there are no common rules, and there are no common things together, then you'll have chaos in the house, right? Everybody will just leave their stuff out, and nobody will clean, and nobody will do anything. It'll just be total chaos. And it's the same, you know, it's the same with the, the equity part, too. In a, families are hierarchies. I don't know what to tell you. And that has to be the case because you do not want your two-year-old to decide what is happening and what the rules are. Right? You, act, you actually have to create an order that is hierarchical. But this is the great thing about Christianity. This is what's great about Christianity is that you realize that the order that Christians believe in is, a, is an order of giving and love. So the hierarchy is there for the people that constitute it. Right? The reason why we have hierarchy is, is so that the person that is leading the hierarchy gives himself to the body that constitute it. Right? And so we have to think like Christians because that's, that's actually how it works. And if, and if it works properly that way, then it is, it is heaven on earth. Like, we, we, are, we would literally have heaven on earth if that's how we, we function. If we had hierarchies that give themselves in love and that people obey the hierarchy, but they do it because they also know that the person that is responsible for them loves them and cares for them and, and that the rules that are there are there for their own good. Um, anyway, so, you know, we, we have to be careful, especially as Christians and as you know, and people that, are, that may be a little more conservative, we have to be careful not to fall into the trap and just want to, to simply you know, react and say, it's like, no, identity, 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 because you know? it's a temptation. But it's like, no, actually, Christ is the answer. You know, Christ is the answer because he, 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 he is that, he has both at the same time. You know, so. Thank you for coming here. And listening to you, it's, I, I realized that it's probably been five or six years that I've been listening to your podcasts. Mm -hmm. And you're part of the reason why I came back into Orthodoxy. 
Um, and so I appreciate that. Uh, can I ask you if you can be just a little bit personal and talk about your uh, walk into orthodoxy uh, from your previous life? And then the other question I had for you is, are the two pieces of wood props here? Or <laughs> is, is that just what? Like the, the pieces of wood on the table? Oh, those? No, they're a gift. They're oh. a gift of boxwood. This is a, it's a gift. Uh, this, is a, this is the best wood for miniature carving. Uh, and uh, thank you. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, yeah, well, you know, I grew up in a very strange, uh, I grew up in a very strange world. That is, I grew up in a, a, pro a Baptist world that were Baptists that were all converts from Catholicism. And so in Quebec, you had this, like, Catholic, Catholic world. Uh, and then in the 60s and 70s, you know, like everywhere in the world, the 70s, 60s happened. Uh, and then there was this mass exodus out of, the, out of the Catholic Church. But some people left the Catholic Church, and then some people, you know, found a, a kind of more vigorous and, and meaningful place in the, the Protestant churches. And that was my parents. So my parents <laughs> grew up nominally Catholic, you know, kind of culturally Catholic, and then found really Christ... <clears throat> in, the, in, the, in the Protestant church, and my father was a Baptist minister, so I kind of grew up in the church, uh, and I'm very grateful, I'm very grateful for that, because it means that I learned the Bible, <laughs> and I learned to love the Bible very much so. Um, but, you know, in my 20s, you know, going to university and then reading, at some point, it seemed that there was something missing, um, that there was, that there was, that there was something missing in the worldview. I don't know why I had the intuition, my brother and I both had similar intuitions, which was, it seemed like, the, like they were, it was very narrow and that what we were encountering in the scriptures you know, and in the different readings we were doing was more like a, like a, like a pattern of reality. Uh, and so that, and also because I was studying art and, and uh, I, I was struggling with being a Christian and a Protestant making contemporary art. All those three things just did not go well together in many ways. Uh, and so discovering the language of the church, discovering the beautiful, the beauty and the kind of coherence of the liturgical language, the icons and the architecture and the hymns, but then also reading, uh, you know, really it was, it was Vladimir Lasky's book that really shocked me and really kind of caught me. And then reading the Church Fathers, uh, especially the Fathers that I reference the most, St. Georg of Nyssa, uh, St. Ephraim, St. Maximus, you know, then, you know, like a lot of people, did a bunch of reading, did a bunch of reading, and then finally I asked around and I asked some of my Baptist pastor friends, they knew Orthodox people, and they, one of them was like, I'm not sure I want to tell you, but I'll, I'll he gave me a, 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 a contact, actually someone who's from around here, is uh, Brandon Gallagher. Uh, that was the first contact I had in the, uh, in the Orthodox uh, Church. And so I, he invited me to go to church, and it was a, um, a pre-sanctified uh, liturgy during Lent. And yeah, it just blew me away because it was, you know, it's like dark church with candles, and we're like putting our for we're like, you know, laying down, putting our forehead on the floor. And there was this, both this very high, meaningful words and and, and, and kind of aesthetic, but at the same time, very embodied and real. Uh, and so that was it for me, just going one time to church. And I was like, it took a while for, you know, for me to actually enter the church, maybe about a year and a half. But, um, but yeah, so that was, that was it. So um, kind of back into the like, identity and a stranger and like, you know, like hierarchy and stuff like that. Um, if I understand kind of what you're saying correctly, when you talk about like, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and making that a highest good, and um, and Christ like coming down the mountain and like walking on the chaos and kind of bringing those all things together, is it is it like as Christians in our current culture where meaning is something that our culture is kind of the paradigm is that the, we ascribe meaning to things, right? So we're always making meaning, and if my meaning doesn't match someone else's meaning, then that's okay, everyone's meaning can be 
and individualized. Yeah. So that's that's over, by the way. That's not true anymore. It's now it's a weird anti meeting that is. It's more. It's it's it's. it's it, anyways, finish. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I guess part of like as like on a practical reality kind of loving and sacrificing ourselves for for the other, like how best do we like meet people where they're at in their kind of in like the cultural capture yeah. of that those ideas, right? Like like I want to love people where they're at. Um, but we're coming at things from such a different paradigm that that like I mean people will be like, well if if you can't accept my identity then you don't love me, right? Except that we're looking at things from different sides. Like, is it that in our own self sacrifice like in in my uh, confidence in my identity being in Christ, do I just is it that I sacrifice my feelings of threatenedness by their strangerness? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, we're in some way we have to be attentive to a weird Christian trickery, you know, like it's a, it's a weird Christian parasite is maybe the best way to understand it. A lot of the things that are happening in our world are kind of like strange deformations of Christian virtues, and that's why it's hard to navigate them because it kind of touches us to some extent, right? And so, and we don't know, we're disarmed because exactly that. It's like, it's like, I'm the stranger, I'm the marginalized, don't you want, can't, you know, why don't you accept me? Right. Um, so there are a few things to think about that. One is to remember the story of Judas that I mentioned, which is that um, there's a difference between the revolutionary desire to self-name, right, and to capture power for oneself in the name of the marginalized or in the name of being marginalized. There's a difference between that and what Christ calls us to do. Those are not the same. And we have to be able to recognize the difference between the revolutionary pattern uh, and the true pattern of love and compassion that Christ teaches. And it's tricky, but if you pay attention, you can see the difference, you know, and you can see it. It's like, uh, when someone uses marginalization in order to uh, accumulate power, for themselves, you know that you're not in the same space. You're not in the space that Christ is describing. It's a very different, weird, upside-down world that you're in. And so you have to be careful, obviously. You don't want to, you have to be wise as a serpent and innocent as a dove, but it's not the, it's not the same as, as, as what Christ is talking about. And so Like we are in a situation where marginalization is a political weapon, is a political tool for the accumulation of power. And, uh, and, and that, is not, that is not what, we have to not let ourselves be deluded by, by that. And so the way to do it is the Christian way. It's always been the same way, it's been the same way forever. You know, in, especially in the Orthodox Church. The Orthodox Church has the highest ideal. The highest ideal is like, you know, I always tell people, you know, it's like, don't actually read the canons of the church because you are going to freak out. Because what is expected of us is so crazy. It is so impossible. Right? But we also know that none of us attain that. And we also know that that's actually, the, that's, the, that's it. That's how it works. It's like we don't, Reduce the ideal for the fact that we, we are all struggling in love towards the ideal. We keep the ideal, right? And then we love each other and we work together 
in the body. And so that is, that is really the solution, is to say, I will not change the standards of the, of the church at all. But I know that I don't reach them. And so, you know, I know that none of you do. And so that's the world we live in. And so we, 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 we move along in love. But as soon as someone wants to change those for some reason, and that you can see there's a weird political power drive behind the desire to change those, then you have, then you have to pique your attention and wonder what is going on here. Right? And be very careful in that road. And so we can see that you know, this this incapacity to differentiate you know, the ideal from compassion and love in the, in the world has now destroyed many churches, right? And it's, and it's, and it's like a lot of the mainline churches, you know, they're, they're dead. They're, they're, it's over. They're empty. They're, that's it. And so we have to, we have to, like, there are, in the Orthodox Church, we know that there are some tendencies pushing in those same directions and we have to be very careful not to, to not to let ourselves be seduced especially especially if we know that there's political power behind it especially when we know that if we go along with it things will be easier for us right and that people will like us more and that you know like people will you know will see us as being with the times and all of that stuff it's like all of those temptations are are dangerous. We should still love everybody with the love of Christ, and you know. So that's a, that's the way I see it. You know, it's uh, it's tricky. We're in for trouble. That's for sure. It's not over. But um. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Jonathan. Um, I just want to know about the publishing company and how it's going and what you <laughs> see the future of it. Guys. Well, thank you. Uh, so yeah, so we started a publishing company a few years ago called Symbolic World Press, and um, we're publishing fairy tales. So we've got eight fairy tales that we're working on, and we're also publishing graphic novels. Uh, so we published one graphic novel <clears throat> um, a year and a half ago, where we just finished the Kickstarter for a new graphic novel now. Um, and the vision of the the vision of the publishing company if I can kind of reduce it to its simple terms, is that I think that we're in a position right now where C.S. Lewis and Tolkien can be kind of like our Old Testament, is a good way to think about it, which is that, that they were in a, in a time when they formulated pagan worlds with Christian messages, right? And so Tolkien basically lives in a, it's like a basic pagan world, that nonetheless is the, the light of, of Christ is kind of peeking through. Uh, and it's hard to understand exactly why it is they felt they needed to do that. I don't know why, but maybe it was because they were still in a kind of very materialistic Christianity where it felt dangerous to touch Christian things because, uh, because they would get in danger. The, you know, people would, would, even Christians would be annoyed with them. Um, but I, our intuition is that we can actually bring that like one level further. And so, for example, the, the, the graphic novel we wrote, it's called, it's called God's Dog. And it's a, it's a version of the story of St. Christopher. Which, and St. Christopher has a dog, dog head in the story. And St. George is in the story. And St. Mercurius and St. Simeon the Stylite. And all these, like, I, we basically took all the craziest saints all the saints that, that, that modern people don't like because they kind of just bother us, our modern sensibilities, just put them in one epic story with uh, Leviathan and giants and all the stuff in the Bible that nobody likes to talk about because it's, it's awkward. And we said, we'll tell this epic story. And I, think, and I, and I do think that, that in some ways we are in a moment where that's become strangely possible. And I don't totally know why, but I think, I think so. Um, and then the fairy tales are the same, is that, you know... <laughs> The big, the big companies, they've basically given up on the fairy tales, you know. And so a few years ago, uh, I knew, because I knew some people at Dis that were working at Disney and were working with Disney, I knew that they, had, they were going to put out a version of Snow White this year. Uh, 
for the 100th anniversary of Disney. But I knew they couldn't. Like, I just knew they couldn't do it. They just can't. They, I knew, I was like, they can't tell the story, Snow White story, because they're not going to have a prince kiss her when she's asleep, because obviously that's abuse. They're not going to, they can't have, they can't have dwarves, because that's awkward. And I was like, they can't tell the story. And so I had written a version of Snow White a long time ago for my children as a little play, and I had some insights about the story that I thought were helpful to kind of help people see what some of the elements were in terms of Christian cosmology. And so I thought, this is a great time to do that. And uh, so we, 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 I wrote Snow White, but then there's, a, it's a really, by the way, for all the artists right now, it's a great, really, now's the time. Like really, like right now is the time to, to grasp it because a lot of the top people, like a lot of the people that are actually amazingly talented, world-class artists are checking out. They just can't do it anymore. And so I was very fortunate to find an illustrator who's now the creative director for the publishing company, who was a designer for all the big, all the big uh, IPs, you know, Harry Potter and, and Disney and Marvel and all of them. And, and, and basically, she was trying to find something more meaningful. And I think that they're going to see a lot of that. So it's a, it's, a, it's a good time. But my publishing company, we definitely had some issues in the last few months problems, business problems, but we're getting better. And so, you know if you know Richard Rowland, who does the podcast yeah, with me? I, I, saw, I saw that too. I saw that, okay, so I, I saw like, it was your partner. Yeah. You said, okay, I met him and I said, you know, you said, okay, I'm missing something about like, something went wrong. Something went wrong. I don't <laughs> something went very wrong. And so, I, I don't want to, I don't want to, I want to be careful, but someone I hired to be very, generous, was not the right person and uh, as, a, as a director for the publishing company and basically crashed everything. And so it means that some, a lot of people actually didn't get their book, Snow White book. And so Richard Rowland, who, is, who does the universal history with me, he is, he's, 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 he's I don't know how to say it, he, he shouldn't exist as a person. <laughs> he really shouldn't exist. But, uh, you know, on top of being, you know, knowing eight languages and, like, translating Beowulf by hand and, and like, knowing every, like, myth in the world and, and also ju doing jujitsu and, like, hunting boars with knives, on top of that, you know, and being an being a award-winning marksman, and I'll just, I could just keep going. And apart from that, he also happens to be, uh, like, a data analyst that, that, uh, that does, um, he does, uh, he evaluates banks in the US. He's like really high up there. So he's like the right, he's just the right amount of detail and like really focused. So he's the best person. I'm really happy to partner with him. And uh, we're already seeing everything kind of come together and you know, we're solving the problems. And so, yeah. Yeah, so. Yay. <laughs> Sorry? Yeah, well, you know the story. You don't know the story about that, huh? <laughs> so we're being recorded, are we? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Be careful. I guess I'll just we'll ask my question from here. I just want to say I, I came for I intended to in, um, attend the entire conference today, but unfortunately I had class commitments, so I um, I came from Trinity Western University to grab this last session. Um, You're the best one. So. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> But right now, I'm in a course that's really engaging with um, Alexander Schmemann yeah. about um, the meaning of symbol. And um, I come from a Roman Catholic background, and we we're discussing the um, kind of the loss of the spirit of what a symbol really is. And um, of course, through classes and everything, I, I still I'm not fully digesting, and it's actually sparked a lot of con um, conversation with my classmates. So um, from someone yourself. Uh, I'm very familiar with your symbolic world, and I was very taken by it. So I was wondering if you could speak to, I guess, what is what is symbol apart from the way it's known colloquially, or as just kind of like a, I don't know, the way a stop sign is yeah. is a symbol for stop. What does it mean? Yeah. Like, well, I did. It's true that I did the whole first session on that, <laughs> so I don't want to go into it too much. 
but I'll give you like I'll give you like a two sentence answer, which is that 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 symbol, the way that I talk about symbol, it's the gathering of multiplicity towards purpose and meaning. So it's not that it's an arbitrary signifier to something else, but it is itself a version of what it's signifying. It's a but at different levels of analogy. That's the best way to understand it. And so it's like it's a pattern that manifests itself at different levels. So those levels, they can signify each other, but not in an arbitrary way. In the, in the manner in which, okay, so a good example would be, you know, when it says in scripture that Christ is the head of the church and the church is the body, that is not a metaphor. That is actually how the church works. The church is a body and Christ is the head, but you can see that there's an analogy between how that works between uh, like a, a head of state and the state and the person, but it's not an arbitrary signification. It is actually the pattern manifesting itself at different in different instantiations. So that's the difference between a way the way the modern way people think of a stop sign, for example, and the way that, that the deepest aspect of symbolism functions. Does that make sense? All right, okay. <laughs> Speaking to the sacrifice of identity or, or the, the sort of the momentarily giving up in an imperfect way of identity in order to align our attentions, my attention with something higher. Um, there's times where I feel like, like that symbolic heaven coming uh, symbols as you've spoken about that story interacts in a way where where I can give something up temporarily that's distracting me to pay attention to something higher. Mm -hmm. And and at the time, like usually food or a phone or like, no, I'm giving this up. I'm paying attention to somebody else. And and then at some point there's like a break in that. And the chaos or the sort of disorder at the edges uh, I let it reassert itself with yeah. more force. And I'm realizing now that the thing that I was worried about, like the fact that the attention was sort of being unified in something higher, like that was good. But then sort of, you know, 90, 80% there at the finish line, Christ says, those who endure to the end. And basically, I've noticed many times I can't endure to the end, 80% of the way through, the finish line is in sight. And then whatever it is that I'm sort of saying, no, this isn't important. I allow myself to to get caught up in that, and sort of the whole structure that I'm trying to maintain just falls, falls, yeah. and the chaos reasserts itself hard. Yeah. It doesn't happen. Yo, it happens to everybody. I don't think you're, it ha this is the, this is how this is the world of the fall. This is the this is how it happens, and so you know we have a help. We have help with that, right? We call it the Jesus prayer. It's a great help because that has that in it. It has that pattern. It's there to help you navigate that problem. Right? It's like the, the Jesus prayer is made of attention, made of invocation and attention and asking for forgiveness basically. Right? So you, you have a moment of attention. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God and then you know that you're not going to hold on to it. Right? You know that you can't and so you say have mercy on me, a sinner. And that's it. Like if you can and, and one of the reasons why I think that that's so an integral part of our tradition is 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 to help us navigate that, you know. Now, and so you can you can pray that, right? You can pray it directly where you actually say it, but you can also think of it as, you know, the 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 how can I say that the structure of how you can live your life, which is that uh, you could call it you could call it attention and memory is a good way to think about it. You know, the story of Jonah has that, that basic structure where as you leave the earth, right, as you go into the waters, that what you want is to remember. That's, that's, that's what, you, what's what you're looking for. And that's what will catch you in the moments where things are kind of falling apart, is to remember that holy place, is to remember God. And so it doesn't mean that it won't be difficult. It doesn't mean that it won't, but if you, just remembering God usually will 
even though you will do that, it'll kind of help you return. And the thing about distraction, and the thing about sin even, is that it's always an opportunity. I know that's horrible to say, I mean, it's horrible to say, but it's like, sin is an opportunity to remember God. I mean, sin is not good, sin is bad. But that's, the, that's, that's what it can give you. It can give you an opportunity to remember God. So when, so when you fall, when you're distracted, when you, when you fall into the chaos, that's why we repent. Because then we, we remember, oh, it was better in that holy place. It was better. And so you go back, and then you fall again, and then you go back. And I know it's annoying, but ultimately, it's like those cycles can shorten, right, in your life. You know, it's like the, the, the big cycles where you fall and you and everything falls apart. And those will always, they'll always be there, I think. I don't know. I'm not a saint, but it's like maybe the saints live in perpetual glory. But at least like what you can notice is that they can shorten. And that the moments that you're distracted, the moment that you fall into bad thoughts, the moment that you sin, can, then you can remember God quicker. Maybe less, less of a... That's the advice I would have. But the prayer is, this, is, the, is the right structure. Okay, everybody. We're done? All right. Everybody, thank you so much for your attention. It was really, it was really great. personally that this, this uh, there's, sometimes there's this tear that there's not enough meaning you know mm -hmm. is this all there is yeah, I'm a Christian you know? <laughs> and, and and so thank you for reminding us and bringing the, the world is pregnant with meaning that's right, yeah. right? That, that, that's so hopeful and uh, may we pray for us pray for us and we'll pray for you thank you as, to enter into that and uh, you know we see uh, the there's a lot happening for you, mm -hmm. and there's doors opening, and we'll pray for you as you navigate all that. Thank you so Come much, yes. And a blessing. Thank you for being here. We have a, a small gift for you. Well, thank Let's you. Let's give uh, Jonathan another hand of applause. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. this banquet of ideas and understandings, very, very helpful. We thank you that they are all like seeds and they will grow in us as we hold them before you and meditate on them. We pray that you bless Jonathan and protect him and his family, uh, bless his, the work of his hands, guide him in all he does, Bring to him like-minded, helpful people, for you are a good God and you love mankind. Amen. Amen. Amen.